Hey you guys, Matt Allen here. Welcome back to Tactical Bass. And today we are taking a deep dive into the world of swim baits, glide baits, multi joints, hard baits, soft baits, trout imitators, bluegill imitators, shad imitators. We're breaking down the entire swim bait category. Let's go. I love fishing with swim baits, soft baits, hard baits, it doesn't matter. They're all so incredibly effective and it's something that we have been doing for decades. About once a year, I take a true deep dive for you guys into the swim bait category. Now we talk swim baits a lot, but today is the day where we are jumping all the way down the rabbit hole. Now, something very different today than we've done in the past. I've actually, as many baits as there are laying here, there's only about half as many as there were in previous swim bait seminars that I've done. Even though there's still a ton of them, the reason why I narrowed it down is I want to go deep into each one of these baits. We're going to talk specifics on why that is a confidence bait of mine what it does differently, maybe hook upgrades, things like that for each individual bait, and then specifically how I fish that bait or where I fish that specific bait. And I just couldn't do that with a hundred different baits. Although we are about to do it with a whole bunch of baits. Now to kick this thing off, I grabbed some beginner baits and I wanna start there. We'll cover these four beginner baits, then maybe we'll talk a little bit about swim bait theory and how this whole thing works. And then we're jumping right in to all of these different categories. I think we'll start with hard baits, you know, glide baits, bluegill uh, profiled baits, multi joints, and then top water. Then we'll get into soft baits, shad baits, bluegill baits, trout style baits. And then we'll wrap it up with rods, reels, gear, hooks, line, you know, all that good stuff. And then I think what we're finally going to do at the very end of this thing, I think I'll jump up set up the camera and I'll actually show you physically some of the retrieves uh, for some of the really unique baits, the baits that are different than the rest where we need to get something specific action wise out of that bait. And I'll show you exactly what I do different for those key bait so that you can actually physically see it and then you can implement that into your fishing. All right, let's kick this thing off with these beginner baits. Then we'll actually start talking broader about swim baits before we get into the, the bulk of these baits. If a guy wants to get into swim baiting, it is not complicated. The first thing I want you to understand, and this does hurt some feelings when I say it, but it's the truth. Swim bait fishing is easy. It is, it is simple. In terms of angler skill, knowing how to work a bait effectively, fishing a swim bait is easier than fishing a jerk bait. It's easier than fishing a topwater, especially something like a frog. It's easier than knowing the differences between jigs and how to fish those effectively around different types of structure. Swim bait fishing is not that complicated because of the amount of drawing power that the bait has. All you have to do is get close to a fish that is willing to feed and the fish will do the rest. Now that's not to say that every time you go out, you're going to catch a giant. That is not what I mean with that statement. But the actual act of swim bait fishing and doing it right is easy. You can do this and you can catch big fish doing it. Now, just to narrow it down for that bare bones beginner guy, you're interested in swim baiting, you wanna dabble, you wanna keep it simple. I've got four baits here for you that are just so easy to fish with. One hard bait, three soft baits. Okay, the first one is this bait right here. That is an S Waver 168. That is no surprise to anyone who's ever heard Tim and I talk about swim baits. We have done more damage with this bait through the years. It's incredible. Now, this bait is overall, actually all four of these baits overall are fairly small in the swim bait world, but they have a lot of drawing power and they catch big fish. You can take this bait straight out of the package with the stock hooks and fish with it. Now, I upgrade mine and we'll get to that later on, but you can fish it completely stock and you'll be fine. You can throw this bait out and just reel it back like it's a slow crankbait. 
and fish will eat it. Now, we'll get into some more advanced twitching them, working them, getting fish to react to them later, but you can just throw this out, wind it back straight out of the package, and it will catch big ones. That's the S Waver 168. It's a small glide bait. For the guy who is around uh, bass that are eating bluegill. You know, maybe you're a guy in Florida where bluegill is just a major food source everywhere. Maybe you're a guy uh, who is fishing primarily ponds or you're fishing a shallower grass fishery uh, where there just is a lot of bluegill or other panfish in the water. This Savage Gear is an incredibly deadly bait. It's a great size because it's a full bluegill profile but the fish can still eat it whole the other great thing about it is it's a line through so the line goes through the nose out the belly you can also go through the nose out the top but i usually prefer belly that makes the bait most stable then you tie on the treble hook that it comes with and you just stick that right into the belly it's protected by these two bottom fins and you can just again chuck and wind that bait. This is what I mean by swim bait fishing is easy. You just throw them out there, wind them back. That bait will be down there kicking. It's got a great swim with a treble hook on the bottom. It's super stable. You can basically do no wrong and the fish will just come out and crush that thing. Uh, it's an incredibly effective bait anywhere bass are targeting bluegill. You can fish it straight out of the package and basically can't do it wrong. Throw it out, reel it back, it'll swim and it will draw fish to it. If you are fishing anywhere where bass are targeting shad, shiners, you know, larger bait fish, it is hard to argue with the Mega Bass six inch mag draft. This little bait right here is such a fish catcher. It's out of this world. I can't count the fish that I catch on this thing every year uh, all over the country. As we travel, this is one of the baits that I will always, always have tied on when I arrive at a new lake. Because again, it pulls fish from a great distance. It fishes fairly high in the water column. So if the water is clear, I'll see fish coming to it, even if they don't eat it. It helps me learn the caliber of fish that are in that lake. But again, throw it out, wind it back. It comes pre-rigged. This is on a swivel. This hook is on a swivel. So it spins around on its own. All you do is just stick it in the belly slot. There's a little magnet to hold it. And that's it. The nice thing about this guy is you don't even need dedicated swim bait gear. Same with all of these, frankly. You don't need dedicated swim bait gear for any of these. You can throw them on 12, 15, 20 pound line and you are going to be just fine. Now I prefer braid to leader. We'll get into that way at the other end of this video. But light line, typical medium heavy to heavy action rod, and you'll be just fine with that bait right there. And then one more, just to downsize it even further, this is the Big Bite Baits B5. True shad imitator. And this is a bait that for the last two years I have been doing so much damage with. Uh, I just, it came on strong for me. I had them in my box for years before I even tried them because it doesn't look like much, right? I can see the weight inside there. Uh, it just doesn't look like a whole lot. But when I put that thing in the water, it starts swimming and those fish just come unglued for it. It has become a confidence bait. So it's an even smaller profile, but still in the swim bait category. And this is a bait that will help you build confidence. You put the line through the nose, slide it through the tube and it pops out at the belly. Then you tie your treble hook on, you insert that treble into the belly and you're ready to fish. That's it. This guy here, I throw this on really light line, which is where my confidence is so high with it. I throw it on 12 to 15 pound line. So even when fish are leery, they will eat this bait. I love to throw it in the fall. When they're corralling bait fish, I have a ton of confidence in this guy. Of course, if I can get them to eat a bigger profile, like the six inch mag draft, I'm going to do that because the odds of getting a bigger fish are better. 
But if I just want to catch fish, if I just want to see will the bass in my lake eat a swim bait, this is a fantastic way for you to build that confidence. Four baits, let me get these out of the way. Four baits that are very, very simple to fish. Basically, you can do no wrong. They don't require dedicated gear and they will help you build that confidence and understand that yes, a swim bait does work where you live because I don't care where you live, a swim bait does work there, period. Not every swim bait works in every situation, but a bass is a bass and bass eat other fish, period. In every fishery, clear water, muddy water, bass eat other fish, swim baits work. Now, I do wanna take just a second, back this thing up. We're gonna talk a little bit of swim bait theory. Uh, and I also wanna talk about, before I even get into the baits, cause I am, I mean, I'm going to give you all of it here today. Uh, there should be absolutely no reason why you can't catch your personal best the second this video is over. Uh, that though brings some responsibility. I really am going to tell you exactly how we do it. And there's some good and bad with that. Once I tell you how to do it, I can't get that information back. And I can't control who's watching this video. I can't control that you are or are not a good steward uh, of our fisheries, that you are going to take care of those fish. But I would ask uh, that you do. So these swim baits truly are capable of catching the biggest bass in any fishery anywhere in the country. With that comes the ability for you to harvest the biggest fish in any fishery. Uh, and I can't stop you from doing that. It's perfectly legal. But I would ask that you don't do that. Uh, mounts, getting a mount done of a bass. Skin mounting is how it used to be done. Skin mounts have a life cycle. If you've ever wanted to get a bass mounted, put it up on your wall so that you could look at it. If you get a skin mount 10, 20, 30 years down the road, those mounts are destroyed. Uh, I know that because I have some. Uh, on the flip side, replicas, where if you catch a giant bass and you take quick measurements of that fish, length, girth, and then take really good photos of that fish, get all of its color detail on both sides real quick, get a picture of you with it, and then turn that fish loose. A replica of that fish, the replicas have come so far, it will be exact to your fish. It's incredible. A replica will not decay over time. So one, you're not killing one of the giant fish that we want in the lake. And I'll get to why we want them in a second. Uh, but two, you're actually getting something, a memory up there on your wall that will last longer. Uh, you know, you get way down the road and you want to show it to somebody, it won't look beat up and destroyed like the mounts we've all seen at a garage sale somewhere. It will look brand new. There really is a difference. There's a reason outside of protecting a fishery to go with a replica over a skin mount today. Now, why is it important to let these fish go? These baits are capable of catching the biggest bass in the lake. There's this misnomer amongst people who don't really understand fish uh, that, you know, this fish is old, it's at the end of its life cycle, I'm just gonna harvest this one, whatever. While that is true, a giant bass tends to be at the end of its life cycle. Not every bass gets to a giant size no matter how long it lives. So some bass have the genetics and they just grow giant. Some of those are genetic flukes and some of those just have great genetics to be really big. Other bass, given 10, 15 plus years, never get past a certain size. You know, they're stunted for whatever reason in their genetics. Uh, just like people, some people are taller than other people and there's, there's no reason for that other than their genetics. So if you catch giant fish and consistently remove them from a lake, those fish are no longer spawning and you literally are changing the genetics of a lake. It sounds crazy to an outsider, but it is a real thing. Uh, you want those fish that reach maximum size to breed in that lake for as long as possible because fish that reach those giant sizes, 
their offspring also have the ability to reach those giant sizes. Now, once their offspring are born, they have an incredible uphill battle, right? They have to survive being eaten by everything under the sun, including other bass, and live their life long enough to get there. But at least those genetics have the ability to do it. So if you catch a giant bass, take care of them. Keep them in the water as long as possible. I like to keep them in the net, in the water, and not even put them in the live well if I can help it. If I need to, I'll put them in the live well for a minute. Anything is better than leaving them on the carpet. Don't put them on the carpet. But keep those fish in the water, grab a camera, get it set up, get your memories, because obviously you're going to get those memories no matter what I say. That's important. I mean, we all want that. We want to be able to remember these fish. Get the photos of that giant bass then get that fish back in the water and don't just dump them back. Sit there with that fish, support that fish while they recover, and then turn those fish loose to help the genetics in your lake continue to grow giant fish. It doesn't impact me, right? Odds are I won't come to your lake. I might, Tim and I fish all over the place, uh, but I want giant fish everywhere for everybody. And that's why I bring this up because truly you're now about to have the ability to catch them what you do from there will impact your lake from there forward. So I at least want to bring up the idea of being a good steward of that resource, taking care of those fish, turning them loose quickly, uh, and helping your own lake for your own fishing and your kids' own fishing. With that, whew, let's jump into this. I'm pumped. I love talking about this category. I love teaching people how to catch bigger fish because it really does work. Uh, and the messages and the emails and the videos and the DMs that we get after doing one of these videos is crazy. So many people catch giants. We're gonna start with the glide bait category, okay? And then we'll just work our way through here. Now, like I said before, I've really narrowed it down. I have left out some very, very good baits. Uh, in fact, in the video description, I will include a link back to one of the other seminar videos that has all the baits in it, in case you want to watch that too. Uh, also, if you're not familiar with these videos, we will link all of these baits in the video description for you in the order that we talk about them until we run out of space. We might run out of space on this, uh, but whether you're watching on YouTube whether you're watching on Facebook, you're watching on our website, wherever you are below the video will be a full description. You might need to click more, scroll down, click more again. You might need to click the three little dots to open that description, but it is there and it has links to all the baits so you don't have to take notes, all the rods, all that stuff. However, we have been having some trouble with YouTube. I don't know why they've been, they've been hiding some of the links. It looks like we've forgotten the links and we haven't. There's an algorithm out there that decides some of them are bad, even though they're not, and it hides them. So if you're looking for something and it looks like we missed it, I guess the, the easiest way to do this is the first link below the description, the first one is going to be to this video on our website. That'll be the easiest. So if there's an issue in there anywhere, you can't find what you're looking for, that link will take you to our site and the full description will be there with every single thing. So no matter what, even if they mess it up, you'll be able to find them. All right, let's jump into it. Glide baits. Glide baits have completely swept the fishing category from coast to coast. Uh, and it is no surprise. The effectiveness of a glide bait is remarkable. Glide baits are single joint baits, hard body, and these baits sort of S through the water. It's a very slow, methodical swim with a couple of exceptions, and we're going to get to that. Uh, but this slow, methodical swim that just sort of pulls fish to the bait. They just sort of draw up and look at them. The beauty of a glide bait over a soft bait is that once you see those fish rise up, you have the ability to work that bait, to twitch it or pop it, and get the bait to move and cut to cause those fish to react and to strike or to feed on that bait. With a soft bait, a lot of times, your only opportunity is just to keep winding. That's all you've got. You just have to keep on swimming and hope that they eat it, but not with a glide. That's what makes them so effective. And I think that is what's causing the explosion of glide baits on the market. 
Uh, to kick this thing off, I wanna talk about uh, the shad style glide or the chopping style glide, a glide bait uh, that can be worked on a steady retrieve, but it can also be worked with a, with a real chop where you're popping that reel to get that bait to cut and to dart very hard motions, a very systematic way to walk that bait. For that, I've got two of them, and this is the first one. So this is the Spro Chad Shad. Uh, the KGB Chad Shad is one of the most popular baits on the market right now. They partnered with Spro to make a very consistent, very cost-effective version of that bait. Now, cost-effective in swim baits, is very different than cost effective in any other category. Know that going in, but it is a very uh, cost friendly bait. They're very consistent and I've had a ton of success with these baits. Uh, if you are fishing a gizzard shad fishery, so a lake where bass are targeting big gizzards or for that matter, really, really big thread fins, or golden shiners or other large shiners. So we're not talking, you know, three, four, five inch thread fins. We're talking six, seven, eight, 10, 12 inch shad or large, uh, large profiled minnows. This style of bait is incredibly effective. A bait where you're chopping it. The, those, those bait fish just move differently uh, than trout and other bait fish. They're much more aggressive. They're very darty. They have very spastic movements in the water, the real fish do. Uh, so that more chop style movement just replicates that better. Now this particular bait fishes extremely well both ways, uh, but I definitely do prefer that chopping style walking that bait subsurface. So I'm not throwing this out there and just reeling it back. I'm throwing it out there and then I'm working the rod tip and the reel together, just little bumps. And it's not exaggerated. I'm not hammering that rod. I'm just bumping it to cause this bait, whoop, to cause this bait to just come through the water fairly aggressively. Now, I promised because we were doing less baits that I would get very, very specific. The bait comes stock with one X hooks on it. You can fish it just like that. That's how the creator of the bait seems to fish those baits. They fish them on straight fluorocarbon. A lot of times you'll see the baits fished on like straight 20 pound or 25 pound fluorocarbon. I personally prefer to upgrade. I'll be specific. Now I will not have room in the description to link hook sizes for every single bait. I can't do that. I'll link the hooks, but I can't give you sizes for every bait. So this, if there's one you wanna know, you need to remember it. On the Spro Chad Shad, on the front of that bait, I upgrade to an Owner ST36. That's that hook right there. That's a 1X treble in a 1 aught size, okay? Then on the back, this is an Owner ST56. That's a 3X treble. It's stronger. That's a size 2. The reason why I run a stronger treble in the back than in the front is just because it's a smaller treble. If you use a 1X size 2 and you hook the right fish, you're going to get bent out, period. That hook is just too light of wire for the gear that you should be throwing the bait on. So again, I'll run a 1X in the front. Just by sheer size, the wire is thicker and it can take the abuse. But in the back, that size 2, 3x. That's the exact way that I set up my Chad Shads. That's how I fish them personally. And it works extremely well. It also helps it's a little bit more weight under that bait and it helps stabilize that bait so I can be really aggressive, really pop it. Like if I see one come up on it and they're aggressive, but they haven't hit it and I want to get more aggressive and really get that thing going, having a little more weight hanging under there just helps stabilize that bait so it can take the harder hit. Next up, from Bait Sanity. 
This is the Chimera Shad. You may or may not have even heard of this bait. Uh, they just recently started shipping. Uh, this is a Tackle Warehouse exclusive bait. So Bait Sanity got together with Tackle Warehouse and they designed this bait. And the fact that it's exclusive is why you may or may not have heard of it because not every tackle shop has them. I was mind blown when I saw this bait in the water. Absolutely mind blown. Um, it fishes so effectively, it's incredible. So again, chopping style bait where you can work it and it'll... But it also has an amazing straight swim and I didn't expect that at all. If you just throw it out there and wind it back like a traditional bait, it has an unbelievable swim. These two baits are probably... I'm willing to say it. They're probably the best glide baits I have seen come out in the last 10 years. They're incredible. And I'm not talking at, at any price or at retail. I'm, I'm talking these baits are way good. This bait in particular is just unreal in the water. I have caught so many fish on them already. Uh, and not just bass. This So look at the hardware on this one. It's got giant 4x hooks hanging on it that's because i've been striper fishing with this bait too and i have caught some absolute freaks of nature on it but this bait comes stock with a nose ring okay a split ring on the nose i keep that although i upgrade it i go to owner hyper wires on all my split rings on all the baits or i take it a step further and i go to hype to ultra wires instead of hyper wires again we'll get to all that but swiveling hook hangers built into the bait. And then it's got a system where it's letting water pass through portions of this bait. So this bait is almost truly neutrally buoyant in the water. Uh, you throw it out there and I mean, it just hovers there. It's incredible. And that allows you to just barely bump, walk that bait, just bump it. Right? It's not even like those hard chops. You're just bumping it and it's just, it's just dancing. It's incredible. And then again, you can just chuck and wind this thing and it's just got this insane gizzard-like swim to it. You know, gizzards are really aggressive. When they take off through the water, super aggressive swim and this has it. And the bass absolutely react to it. Comes in a bunch of great colors. It's got that soft tail, which doesn't get in the way at all of your hook sets. Now, obviously this is not stock hardware. It's also not what I recommend for bass. For bass, I would fish almost that exact same setup. I'm fishing an ST36 one aught in the front. And then I'm fishing either that exact same ST56 uh, number two in the back, or you can upgrade. I'll go back to that ST36, the 1X in a size one for the back. You don't want great big hooks on this bait because the actual hook hangers are fairly close together. So even though it's a large bait, like look at them side by side, it's a very large bait. The hook hangers themselves are much closer together. So I'm able to go with smaller trebles on it and still be really effective and get a great hook up on that bait. But I just can't overstate enough how shocked I was with how this bait swims with multiple retrieves and how the fish are reacting to it. That is an incredible glide bait for imitating shad and other minnows. All right, let's jump into the more traditional style glides. I've only got four more glide baits that we're going to talk about today. That's it. Really trying to narrow this thing down and keep it simple for you guys. The next one up is the S waiver. Uh, we're gonna talk about both sizes. This is the S waiver 200, the larger size. It is a phenomenal trout imitating glide. Uh, it also comes in a bunch of shad type colors and we throw all of those. But I will say with the advent of some of these other shad glides, 
that for me, the 200 is, is more in that trout category than it used to be. A lot of times, if I'm switching over to, to shad type imitators, I'm switching bait style. But the S Waver 200 is a remarkable bait, fishes incredibly well. Uh, it sinks a little bit quicker than the others. And I'll throw that bait out there and then just give it that slow, steady wind. It's got a good open water swim to it, a good wide glide on a steady retrieve. No need for chopping that bait at all. But what I'll do is I'll let it get gliding. I'll go three, four, five, six handle turns and then two twitches. So that bait will get this wide glide and then cut, cut, and then continue that wide glide. And those cuts are what causes those fish to really react and fire off and eat that bait. Now, one thing that I will say is in this entire glide bait category, there is, there's a huge movement with live, right? So guys that are using live sonar to spot fish and throw a glide bait to them and catch those fish. One thing that's really important to do that effectively is baits that fall faster. Guys are weighting their baits down all sorts of ways. The S waiver is probably my favorite bait for doing that because it takes weight so well. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to weight a bait down. You can use strips on it. Um, here's one. Now these are actually from Bait Sanity. These are little tungsten strips. Um, you can also get suspend strips, little lead strips that I'll typically what I'll do if I want to add strips to get my bait down is I go one down the chin and then two across at the front hook hanger. Then maybe one back here over the, the river to see logo as well. That's typically enough to get a faster fall out of the bait so that I can use it more effectively with sonar. That's not my personal favorite way to fish a glide. I like to just go out and chuck them, but a lot of guys are spending more time doing that. If you wanna be effective doing it, weighting those baits down is important. So that's the first way. The second way is to wrap lead wire around the shank of the hook. The third way is to clip a little weight on as well. So you've got your hook and a weight dangling there. Both wire wrapping the shanks and hanging that extra weight are not things I'm a big fan of. Anything that gets in the way of that hook point that shortens that gap just does not work for me. It's not that it doesn't work, but I don't like the idea of anything being in the way of those hook points. So for me, I'll go with strips unless I absolutely have to add more weight than that. Now, back to this bait specifically, it fishes very well stock, fishes very well weighted down. It's a very forgiving bait. A lot of baits, when you start playing with weighting, you completely wreck the action and they just don't have the swim anymore. This is one of those baits that keeps it swim. It's got a lot of wiggle room in it, if you will. You can go to bigger hooks, smaller hooks, add weight, take weight away, and you still get a really good swim out of the S waiver. But I do change my stock hardware on this one as well. This is bone stock. It comes with two, two aught trebles. And I am not a fan of a two aught. And it's, you would think I would be. In your mind, bigger trebles should hook up better. I can't tell you why they don't, but I can tell you that I've been fishing an S waiver since almost the day it came out. And I hook more fish if I drop down to one aught trebles on this bait. So I lose both of these. Again, I go to owner hyperwire split rings and then I put ST36, so again, the one X trebles, a one aught front and a one aught back. They're smaller than stock, but my hookup ratio goes up. My theory, and it's not just a theory, I've watched it for years in clear water, bass love to come in and just pop the head of this bait. And when they do that, the two aught hangs farther away than a one aught. A one aught will just be up here a little bit higher. And as a result, I think that hook catches more often on that fish, even when they don't T-bone it. If they T-bone it, they're gonna get it, right? They're getting a hook. But if they take that head shot, it's easier for that smaller hook that's up higher to stick them, just skin hook them. And then after that, they tend to thrash and get another hook into it themselves. Uh, but that's how I fish that bait. 
most effectively. And then the smaller size of the S waiver is the 168 that we started off with. Um, I can't overstate how effective this bait is. When it comes to swim baits, the bigger the bait, the more drawing power that you have. An eight inch bait will pull fish way farther than a six inch bait. A 10 inch bait will pull them way farther than an eight inch bait. It's amazing how much farther they'll come to a larger bait. With that in mind, if you are swim baiting with a friend, just a little friendly tip here for you. Always be the guy throwing the larger bait. Seriously, if you've got a guy throwing an S waiver 200, an eight inch bait on the front of a boat and a guy throwing a 168 behind him, the guy throwing the 168 will see like five fish a day. And the guy in the front will see a hundred fish a day because they've already drawn to the bigger bait. Then a small one comes along, they don't care. Uh, so seriously, always be the guy throwing the larger bait if you want to draw more fish. That said, on fisheries where these fish are seeing glide baits, where a lot of people are swim baiting, we saw it on Clear Lake year after year. We'd be crushing them on a waiver 200. Springtime would get fired up. Those tournaments would start coming, right? Clear Lake took a beating almost unlike anywhere else. The TVA is pretty similar. It takes a hammering in the springtime. The amount of boat traffic is incredible. And on Clear Lake, they were all swim baiting. Once that starts up, those fish would get super leery of those bigger baits. And one of Tim and I's tricks was to go back down to that waiver 168 and we would crush them. It was, it was not a thing about drawing power at that point. It was that every stinking fish landing in the water that was eight inches long or larger had treble hooks hanging on it. I, I believe that the bass just got leery of that entire size category. They just stopped eating them. But when we drop down to a smaller profile and come creeping through there, we'd start plucking fish off because those fish still needed to eat and they were eating in that smaller size range. So the amount of damage we've done with that bait compared to the size of the bait is crazy. Now, stock hardware, you can take an S waiver 168 straight out of the package today and fish it. But just like the 200, the hooks are actually bigger and stronger than what I prefer to put on that bait. I found that if I drop the stock hardware and I go to number four split rings, and then I go to ST36, I'm sorry, ST56, so the three X hook, ST56 size two front and back, that actually lightens the weight up on the bait a little bit. It makes it more lively the bait darts and cuts better than it does stock. Uh, and my hookup to land ratio is unbelievable. You can fish it stock, but if you lighten that hardware up a bit by going to those three X's, the bait gets more going on. It'll cut harder, it'll dart farther, uh, and it just gets that much more fishy. This is a bait that I like to be very darty and aggressive with. Still a slow roll. So I want that S out of this bait, but a lot of twitching. So four handle turns, two twitches. So that same deal where it's S-ing and then I get those harsh cuts out of it. But I do a lot more reel bumping. As the years have gone on, I'm very aggressive with this bait. Sometimes I'll be reeling along and then I'll twitch, 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 twitch. You know, just and then go back to the swim because it does both really effectively. But it's just a great size range that those fish respond to very, very well. And again, I don't know which, I haven't even thought about which baits I'm gonna tie on here for you in a few minutes and show you the retrieves, but maybe I'll show you one of those waivers in the mix. Next up, again, I've really tried to narrow it down. This is the G-Rat Sneaky Pete. This bait is in here because it is unlike any other glide. There are dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of glides on the market, but a lot of them do really similar things. And when Tim and I are seeking out glide baits, like how do we choose these baits over all those others? There's some criteria that they have to meet. They've got to be really easy for anyone to pick up and fish effectively. They've got to be very consistent. Uh, you know, a lot of guys like throwing custom glides and I don't blame you. I own a lot 
of custom glides. I own too many custom glides, to be honest. Uh, but I find that custom glides, when I'm buying customs, one of them will have it. It'll have that magic. And the other five I bought don't. Uh, because it's very, very hard in the custom world to be consistent. Humidity is a huge deal. If the humidity changed between the baits you poured tonight and the baits you pour tomorrow morning, the baits react differently. Uh, so there's nothing against custom. I'm a huge fan, but I need to know that if I recommend a bait and a guy buys a bait and goes out and tries it, that it's going to do what I told him it will do if he works it the way I explained to work it. And the easiest way to do that is with baits that have been built in a factory. So plastic baits, essentially, you know, made out of the same stuff as traditional crankbaits, uh, where the actions are very, very consistent. Now in the past, a lot of those factory baits were trash, man. A lot of them. Uh, because the people building them either didn't understand swim baits, didn't know what they were doing, or frankly didn't care. And the custom guys did care. Uh, but as time goes on, I mean, the Spro Chad Chad, that bait, Sandy, those two baits by themselves are insane. They are so, so good. And those are factory built baits. So not to say that there won't ever be a bad one to come out of a factory. I mean, things are going to happen, right? Somebody's going to put some glue in the wrong place and mess up a joint. But if you take 100 of one versus 100 of the other, the consistency of a factory bait is remarkable. So they've got to be consistent they've got to be available because I don't want to teach you how to work a bait and then you not be able to get one for the next three or four years. That is a complete waste of time. Uh, now, I also want them to do different things and where the sneaky comes in is the sneaky, you may not know this, started its life as a completely custom bait. The G-Rat guys uh, were hand pouring the sneaky before they decided to turn it into a factory bait for consistency. The Sneaky actually was a completely custom uh, made in California swim bait. But the Sneaky of today, the factory bait, does some super cool stuff. So one, it is loud. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Crazy loud. If you are fishing a California trout or kokanee fishery with 20, 30, 40 feet of viz, that much sound is not a good thing. If you are anywhere else where you've got one foot of viz, three foot of viz, five foot of viz, shad eaters, bluegill eaters, a little bit of racket is a good thing. I do a lot of damage with swim baits that make sound. The S waver, nowhere near this loud, but it's still a loud bait. They work. The Sneaky is also, the guys who build these baits, they fish rivers for striper as much as they bass fish. So they built the bait to be able to do both very effectively. Uh, they fish the bait a lot on Clear Lake, where Tim and I used to live. And Clear Lake, the name is a misnomer. It is a murky lake. Most of the time, it's very murky. So they've got that bait dialed to draw fish in that murkier water and it works. But they also doubled down and worked on getting that bait to keep that awesome, super aggressive swim, even in current because they are river fishermen. It's very hard to get a glide bait to maintain its swim in current. Notice how short this bait is compared to most other glides. A lot of glides are tall. That's a great looking profile, but you throw that in a river situation, whether you're fishing for bass or striper or muskie or anything else, if you throw it in a place with a lot of current, it absolutely wrecks the action. The TVA where I live now, Lake Chickamauga, we have a lot of current out here, right? This is the Tennessee River and it is flowing. Those taller baits get messed up by that current. The sneaky, Fish is the same with or without current. It is a very, very effective bait. And that is why it will always be in that lineup because there are guys fishing in places where you need that style of bait and it is very hard to find. The Sneaky though is another one of these baits where I really have to play with my hardware. It's actually 
the exact same hardware that's on a Spro Chad Shad after I upgrade it. So I upgrade my rings to number fives, one aught ST36. So the one X hook in the front, one aught. And then again in the back, it's that number two, three X, the owner ST56. The reason why it took me forever to decide on a hook arrangement for this bait. I mean, it sounds arbitrary, right? You're like, oh, that's pretty similar. That's pretty similar. I have changed hooks around on these baits forever. I've dealt with different colors, different numbers of hook points, different sizes, different wire strengths, different weights of hooks until I'm confident that, yeah, that one's dialed. Yeah, that one's dialed. I have a ton of confidence in owner trebles on my big baits. I do, but those specific hooks in those specific places, the reason why you have to go to a size two on the back, see how slim this is back here? If you go larger than a size two, let me put this up here where you can see it. See how that can't get up over the back? It can just get up here and scrape. If you go any larger than a size two, that can hook over the back. And once it hooks over, your cast is ruined. And if a giant fish saw that, that fish is now leery of that and less likely to bite on your next cast. So again, a size two in the back is critical, but I want that one aught in the front. I want it hanging low, but I want it high enough that if a fish head shots me, there it is. See that where it's touching? I can stick that fish. So getting the right hooks on these baits is everything. And this is the stuff I really didn't have time to explain in the last full seminar because we were covering so many different styles of bait. And we really haven't even gotten down to like the where I fish these baits. Uh, we did a lot more of that in the last one, but I'll try to get some of that for you as well. And let's get through the last of the glides and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. The last glide bait in the bunch is another bait sanity. This is the Trout Explorer. And that's the last of the glides. The Trout Explorer is the most cost-effective big glide that there is. Uh, it is a true open water glide bait. And actually that's probably the right place to talk about where we're fishing these baits. Uh, and then we'll finish up with this bait. I break my, my glide baits. I've always broken them into two categories. Now there's kind of three because we have these true like gizzard style glides. Uh, but breaking it into three categories, we've got gizzard style glides. We'll put them over there because you can throw them everywhere. Gizzards are crazy. Sometimes they're out running around in the open. Sometimes they're back in the grass. Sometimes they're around docks. You throw those things everywhere. If they're on gizzards, that's its own animal. Other than that, we've got cover glides and open water glides. The S Waver 168, uh, frankly, that Sneaky Pete, those are more cover glides. Those are baits with tighter actions. So an open water glide is, you know, that huge sweeping S swim, you know, the slide swimmer, um, Hinkle Trout, uh, there's a bunch of baits, the Mother. There's a lot of baits that are big, open water glide baits and just big sweeping turns. The value of that and the reason we throw it in open water, and when I say open water, in my mind, I'm throwing those on floating docks for suspended fish. I'm throwing them on long tapering points over the tops of island tops where I need to draw those fish up off the island top. Truly open water. The value of the bait is that the swim is so wide that the drawing power is out of this world. Fish will come for miles to get to that bait. But the other value is that the swim is so wide that the forward motion is fairly slow, right? If my bait's doing this, my forward motion is pretty quick. So that wide glide allows the bait to cover tons of water, have a great swim, pull fish, but I'm not actually leaving their zone very quickly and it gives them time to get to the bait. Whereas a cover glide is moving much, moving forward towards the boat much faster. And I'm able to pop it and work it much more erratically when I want to. I can add those twitches and those darts. So a cover glide, you're going to see me fishing it around cover. 
right down the shoreline, throwing up here at targets, laid down trees, standing timber, dock pilings, grass edges, anywhere where I think the fish are right there, ready to ambush. You know, they're within, let's say, five or six feet of the bait. In that situation, I'm working that glide, slow, steady swim, and then when I give it those pops, that's to get that fish to commit. So I'll throw down the side of a dock, swim it, slow S swim, down the side of the dock, here's the piling, past the piling, because the fish should be sitting on the piling looking out. That's, if they wanna feed, that's what they're doing. So I pass them, like I don't see them, and then as soon as I get clear of the piling, I throw my two twitches in. What I'm going for is that I'm swimming, the bass sees it. They hold their position as an ambush predator. As I pass, now they know they're in the clear. The fish doesn't see them. They'll immediately come out. They're looking for their opportunity to strike. And as soon as I do my two twitches, the first twitch says, you're busted, I see you. The second twitch is them, the bait, making its run. It's trying to escape. And that bass will either let it escape or they'll smoke it. So slow, steady retrieve, bump, bump. It's almost always right after the second bump, that's the impact. Those fish are following, the bait turns. If it was a live fish, it's now seen the bass. The next motion is it fleeing, bass commits. With the gizzard baits, it's a little different because you're much more erratic, but if I see a bass behind it, I get even more erratic, right? Same concept, I'm getting all crazy, like that gizzard chad starting to freak out, trying to get that fish to commit to it. Now, other end of the spectrum, that open water glide, we're all the way back here, is all about that big swim, lazy, giving fish time to arrive at the bait. The downside of open water baits is that the vast majority of open water baits don't twitch well. They're good at one thing and that's the big lazy swim. You try and twitch them and it's a mess. They roll, they'll go completely upside down or they'll turn so far around that there's no good way to bring them back. And when that happens, they get in that weird like, the fish let them go. They know it's not real. It's very hard to find an open water bait that twitches well and is at an effective price. And that's where that explorer comes in. That bait is the best bait I have found. It's the best compromise where I've got a reliable bait with a fantastic open water swim. It's a great imitator. I mean, look at that TW steelhead color. It's an insanely good imitator of a trout. Their kokanee color is great. Uh, great open water bait, but I can still give it those pops and it'll turn and it'll do, it'll do the darts, but it won't overdo it. It won't turn and come all the way back around. Now, if you hit it too hard, it will. Again, how you work the bait matters, but I can give it, I don't give it like an S waiver 168, pop, pop. That's not how I hit this. These I'm reeling, it's time to twitch it and I just bump, bump, okay? It's not a pop, pop, it's just a bump, bump, and that gives it time to glide. But it's not going to glide all the way around and get itself backwards and get screwed up. It's a very, very effective bait. This bait comes stock with one aught hardware. I like the one aught hardware, but I do upgrade it. I go to those ST36 one aughts. If I'm fishing around giant fish, like I know I've got a shot at a monster, then my back one, I'll actually, I'll go to a two aught up here sometimes. Uh, again, it's open water. It's a different animal than the small baits, but typically I stay one aught there in the back, I'll go down to a size one, three X, that owner ST56 again. That three X, if I stay in a one aught, it's such a large profiled hook, I lose confidence. Uh, so I drop down a size, that way the overall hook is, is not much bigger, uh, but I've gone to a three X wire. The reason why is that if the fish are nippy, they're not really committing because sometimes they'll headshot every single time. And a giant largemouth, I mean, they'll get half that bait down on a headshot. They're hooked well. But some days, something is wrong in the environment and they're just nipping the bait. 
and every single fish will come up hooked on that back treble. This is a lot of bait to have outside a fish's mouth, right? If they come up thrashing, they can, they can throw this almost every time. If they get both hooks and they come up thrashing, you're in good shape. But if it's one of those days where they're getting that back hook, so that's all that's in the mouth. And it's usually one hook point that's in the mouth. And all of this is slinging. It's going to rip that thing out if you're letting them do that. It's all about controlling the fish at that point. So the bigger the bait, the harder I pull on the fish once I've hooked them. I stick them and I don't want them jumping. If a giant comes up to thrash, I pull so hard. My entire goal is to knock them over. So I see... I mean, YouTube is full of videos of guys that, that are like, I lost a 10 pounder. It doesn't look like a 10 pounder, but that's what the title says. Some of them do though. Some of them you're like, did that dude, that dude just lost a teener, right? It's crazy. The videos that exist when those fish come up thrashing, I just cringe, man, just cringe. And we have those videos too. We've lost several double digits on camera through the years that you watch the video and you're like, yep, I agree. That was a double digit. It's painful, but what you can do, a smaller bait, like an S waiver 168, a mag draft, a six inch mag draft, something like that. When they come up thrashing, usually you're good because the bait itself doesn't weigh that much. This is also an issue with custom baits. Custom resin baits tend to weigh a lot. So if you are a custom guy, listen closely because this will help you too. All of this is stemming from me telling you I upgrade that back hook to a 3X. What I'm getting at is I upgrade that to a 3X so that I can pull harder and I won't bend the hook out. Okay, that's the actual connection. Now, here's the deal. If you stick those fish and you're grinding and they're staying down, you're good. Just keep grinding. It's when a bass gets the head shakes going that they can kick the bait out. But above water, way worse than below water. If they get their head out and they get a full shake and you're not controlling them, if you survive that and keep them pinned, it's a miracle. You're supposed to catch that fish. That fish should come off just because of the weight of the bait. So again, what I'm doing, I stick my fish and I hit them hard. I don't care if they hit a soft bait or a hard bait. I hit them hard, all of them, boom. Load them up, then start the grind. If I'm watching my line and my line is rising, right? I can tell that fish is coming up. We all know what's gonna happen. We all know she's gonna jump. I am prepared. I'm already full winch, rod is full loaded. The second she starts to break surface, I literally pull harder. My actual goal is to take a fish that wants to do this and knock them over. If you do that, if you successfully knock them down, they are now on the surface, mouth open, and they can do nothing. And it is just a winch ride to the boat. It's not the most fun fight in the world, but it is incredibly effective and you will get your photo with your PB. If you don't do that, you have flipped a coin on whether or not that is about to be your PB or you just got to see her once. You've got to knock them over when they start the shake. I told you, we really are gonna give you everything. This is how we do it. There are no secrets. Don't let those fish thrash. Now, the smaller the bait, obviously lighter, lighter line, lighter gear. You can't always stop the jumps. You can't pull hard enough. But proper swim bait rods, and there's a bunch of them on this boat, you've got the power to knock those fish down and you need to take advantage of that. So with that, we are wrapping up glide baits. Glide baits are an incredibly effective way to catch giant fish. Now I've gotten so worked up, I'm hot as can be, even though it's cold out here today. So I'm gonna get out of this hoodie, I'm gonna change a battery, and we're jumping into bluegill baits. Now for bluegill baits, this is even simpler. I've got four baits for you, and all four baits are very, very different. I really wanted to simplify this category. If you are on a fishery where you know they're targeting panfish, be that bluegill, crappie, anything like that, there's a lot to be said for that type of profile. I didn't used to throw bluegill profiles at all. I would throw 
trout profiles or minnow profiles in bluegill colors. It's just the last few years that there's been more and more bluegill style baits that are in a shape bass can get effectively. What I mean is most bluegill swim baits used to be really tall. They had big fins and when uh, the fish would eat them, but they just bounce off them, right? When you see a bass floating, dying in the water and they've got a fish stuck in their mouth, nine times out of 10, it's a bluegill stuck in their mouth. In the real world, that is a difficult profile for them to eat. So it's even more so with a hard bait, it's harder for them to get that into their mouth. So I, I applaud all four of these baits for being a true bluegill type profile that doesn't have giant fins and that is still short enough that the bass can get a hold of them and hook up effectively. Uh, that is a major, major deal when I'm looking for a bluegill bait. So we've got a glide, a couple of multi joints, and one that's a little different, but we have to talk about it. This is that Bait Sanity Explorer Gill. This is an awesome bluegill glide. It was the first bluegill glide that I ever got where I was like, okay, that glides awesome and looks like a bluegill. There was always a give and take. This bait is legit and there's a lot that's gone into it. They did a great job of getting that profile down, minimizing those fins. They've got soft pads inside the joints. Uh, so it's got a very, very subtle, quiet, natural swim. Uh, it's really a unique bait and it's very, very well done. And you can change out tails on these baits as well. You have options uh, in the different tail styles. And I mean, they have some that are pretty wild that make the bait do some different things. But just the stock tail on this bait is awesome. Again, I do upgrade hardware. In the front, it's all ST56, so it's 3X hardware on this bait. A size one in the front, a size two in the back. Those are number five hyperwire split rings. And I change that one on the front. That's a hyperwire as well. That way everything is upgraded and I can pull really hard. Uh, again, for me, I throw bluegill baits around cover. Okay, so I'm either fishing docks or grass. And on my lakes, I fish a lot of grass. So I'm fishing grass edges with this bait. And when I stick them, they wanna go in the cover. So just like when I'm throwing a giant open water bait and I need to knock a fish down, these are fish that I've got to stop from going into the cover and get them to come my way. I gotta turn them. And in order to do that, I need 3X hardware. Otherwise, I'm just along for the ride and I end up stuck in the junk. So 3X hooks allows me to pull really hard on the fish. Fishing the bait is simple. A fish is much like an S waiver. Slow cadence, it also chops really, really well. So like if I'm going over the top of grass and it's fairly murky, you'll see me chop that bait a lot just to add more clack to it because it is a very subtle bait uh, and I can get those fish to react and come out, but it'll straight swim extremely well too. That is my favorite bluegill glide. Now on those split rings, let me stop for a second and talk split rings. Otherwise I'll forget to do it. We've already talked about hooks. You know, there's your ST36, ST56, 1X, 3X, but split rings. This is one of the most overlooked things. Man, now it's kind of chilly. I went too far the other direction. It'll be all right. Split rings are overlooked. Guys will upgrade their hooks. They understand they need a sharp hook. Then all of a sudden their giant comes off, they reel up and their hook's not there. It happens. Or you do get your fish, you check your gear afterwards before you make your next cast, and one of your rings looks like an eight, right? It stretched it. Upgrading your split rings is something you should never overlook. I change everything. And I'm talking like tiny crankbaits on up. I change all my rings. I'm fanatical about it. I also don't use snaps on the nose. I use split rings so that I know that I know that I know that that's not a failure point. If you use snaps, more power to you, but the day may come where that snap opens up. It has the ability to open. That is sketchy. Snaps have come a long ways. Snaps of the past, they were going to open. Snaps have come a long way, but for me, a split ring is still the surefire way that I'm never going to have an issue. 
Now, the hyperwire is like the gold standard. That's what we've always used. But starting a couple years ago, because I was striper fishing, I started using ultra wires. They're even thicker. Now they make ultra wires all the way down to a three. For a, for a strength comparison, here's a number six hyper wire. That's about as big as I go on my big baits. It's a 70 pound split ring. It is strong. Okay, here's a number four ultra okay way 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 smaller than this number six it's rated to 90 pounds it's rated higher than that number six like a number three ultra tiny little split ring is still super super strong this one right here is stronger than a number seven hyper wire so if you need strength and you want to downsize so you don't want your hooks hanging way down you really want to slim it up. Maybe your fish are no-shotting your baits. Go to a number three or a number four ultra, tuck that hook up, and that thing is bomb-proof, man. I mean, they, it's hard to open them with split ring pliers. You've got to have really good split ring pliers and then really grip them to even open those things. They're that strong. But either way, hyper wires or ultra wires will absolutely help you land fish. You will not have failures that you would have had. All right, back to the bluegill baits. We've talked about the bait sanity. The next one up is the Jackal Ganterelle. This is the best way I know to describe it. It's the opposite of a glide bait. I've talked about it for years. We crush fish on these things. Uh, even bringing it up, I know we're gonna get hammered, but our Guyana footage never came out. The project is so large that we would have to stop making regular videos for you guys for such a long period of time to get it done that we finally just set it down. I hope someday it does come out. I really do, because that trip was out of this world. But it was terabytes on terabytes on terabytes of footage, so we just had to set it down for now. Uh, but in that, in that trip, in that video, we caught arapaima that are just massive, massive. The biggest arapaima I've ever seen. I, I had the pleasure of catching this thing. It was freakish. Took three of us to hold it. My arms are like this, trying to hold this thing. I caught it on a ganter rail. It's crazy how good these baits are. So with a glide bait, steady retrieve, twitch, twitch, get it to cut. Very aggressive movement. The Ganterelle is the opposite. I like to slow roll it and then pause. Slow roll, pause. So where a glide bait will do this and then cut, cut. A Ganterelle wanders nice and slow and then off she goes and then comes back in. When you pause, it just sort of drifts. It's a different look and they massacre it. And it's a fun bite because the glide bait, I'm twitching that thing so hard that when they hit it, it's like, clunk, clunk, you know, they crush that thing. The ganterelle, when I pause, it sort of slacks out. So sometimes they'll catch it on the slack and I don't even know what happened. Most of the time you feel it, but it just goes tick because it's through the slack line. But every once in a while, I won't even know it's happened. So I'll be winding, pause and I'll go to wind again. And the second I go to wind, it's like, because they're already there. They've grabbed it and turned and they just yank that rod. It's different because you're not in position, right? I'm like pointed at it, doing it, and it just stretches your arm. It's a really fun bite. That ganterelle is just, they're a one-two punch. They're opposites of one another, but same deal. See how slim this bait is? Excellent hookup ratio, but still has uh, a true bluegill profile and this one in particular this color is my personal favorite this one then the ghost then the dark and then all the others uh, but that is just such a deadly bait next one up is the bull gill the bull gill is a true multi-joint and i'm gonna fish it just like the other multi-joints but we haven't gotten to those yet this is a burner bait for me so i fish oh let me back up the ganterelle the hardware is identical to the bait sanity, the exact same. Size one, size two, three X trebles. The bowl gill, I fish with lighter trebles, although they're large. 
I've got a one aught in the front and I've got a size one in the back, both ST36, so both 1X trebles. That is a lot of hook for that bait, right? It's easy for them to catch each other, but they don't typically catch each other because of the way I fish it. I burn this bait. It has one job for me, that's it. When fish are up high on grass, I throw this bait and I mean, I'm just covering water, going fast. What makes it so unique, it's got this super aggressive swim, but then I can pause. So it'll be, and then when I pause, it kind of turns. But I don't, I don't pause it like a glide bit. I'm not letting this thing wander off like a ganterelle or dart like other glides. This is burn, 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 stop, burn, 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 stop, burn, burn, stop, burn, stop. Super aggressive. So as a result, even though the hooks are big, they're always straight back. I never stop long enough for that bait to like have the hooks came, come down where they even could tangle. Just a burner bait. I go with such large hooks for the bait because the fish that are taking a shot at it are just taking a shot. I'm going so fast, burn, 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 pause, burn, burn, pause, burn, burn, pause, that they just have to, as it goes by, just lash out and, and try to catch it, essentially. So it's always a slashing bite. It's never like a straight on head shot, crush the bait. It's always like their best attempt to grab it while it's passing. It's truly a reaction bite. If fish don't want to eat, they're in a foul mood. They're just lazily following along. It's a true reaction where they have to fire off and catch that thing. It's a cat and mouse game and I want them to catch it, but I go with those bigger hooks, that great big hook compared to the size of the bait so that when they do lash out and take their shot, they've got good odds of getting a hook point. I also stick with one X hooks because whether you're using an owner, a Gamakatsu, a BKK, you know, a, a Hayabusa, a variety of brands of hooks, 1X hooks are almost always straight or close to straight. Once you get to stronger hooks, 2X, 3X, 4X, they tend to tip those points in towards the shank. That helps with the strength. Straight up like that hooks up a lot better when they're just darting out and slashing at a bait. If my hook point is tipped in and they just swipe, odds are they won't get the point. They have to eat it whole to get the point on a tipped in hook. So that one X hook, fairly straight angled, hooks up better as they just graze across it. Thus, one X, even in the back, even on the weaker, smaller back hook, I'm one X because I'm just trying to get a hook point in them. It's a balance after that because I can't pull them on, I can't pull on them as hard, but I wouldn't have even hooked them if I was fishing an EWG style hook with tipped in points. Last but not least, we come to the Mega Bass Vitalian. The Vitalian is a cool bait. It is barely a swim bait. It's more of a jointed crankbait, but it is so deadly it has to be included even when I eliminate half the baits from a category. I have done so much damage with a battalion across species. Giant peacock bass, giant largemouth, big smallmouth. I mean, you name it, I have crushed them on a battalion. This thing has racket. I mean, it's loud, it's aggressive, very similar to that bullgill. I'm burning this bait. Burn, pause, burn, pause, burn, pause. Stock hardware, it floats. If you go to really heavy hardware, it'll sink but I fish it so fast and aggressive, it doesn't matter if it's sinking or rising because I barely pause. Just burn, 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 stop. Burn, 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 stop. Just let it kind of twitch. So it'll burn, 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 and then it kind of kicks out. Burn, 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 kicks out. The fish are trying to catch up to it, same as that bull gill, trying to catch it, and when it pauses, they get a hold of it. Now, the bait is so much smaller, and one of the hooks is directly in the very back that I'm able to throw it with 3X hardware and still get a good hookup ratio, right? If they swipe for the back of that bait, what do you think they're gonna get? They are getting a face full of treble hook. Hookup ratio is phenomenal. So I don't care at all. So I go with 3X hardware so that once I've got them, I can really pull on them. Both front and back 
are number twos. Again, it's barely large enough to be in the swim bait category, but it crushes. It is such a great bait anywhere that they're eating bluegill or smaller bait fish. You know, not tiny bait fish. We're not talking about throwing a little crankbait. It's still large compared to a traditional bait, uh, but quite small compared to some of our big baits. But a really good profile that hooks up extremely well. And with that, we're done with bluegill hard baits. Let's move on. Actually, before we move on, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to take a second to talk about some of these rods, okay? And then we'll jump back in because we've still got way more than half of the baits left to go. Um, when it comes to hard baits, I like rods that are pretty parabolic, rods that load up. But there is this trend now for rods that are even softer than that because a lot of guys uh, some of the bait makers that are really vocal are throwing on straight fluoro and it's light fluoro you know 20 pound fluoro to throw giant baits if you're going to do that you've got to go to a lighter rod to keep those fish pinned up uh, because you can't pull on them as hard so you got to keep the rod loaded and hope that that works for you it's not my favorite way to fish a glide. I like to upsize my hardware. We've been talking about this. I also upsize my line, that's coming later. Uh, and I upsize my rods and I really drag those fish. But there's absolutely a trend of guys that are going to softer rods, treating these baits more like a big crankbait than a swim bait. Uh, and trying to keep fish down that way by not pulling quite as hard and just not pulling on them hard enough that they wanna come to the top. Just a different way of doing it. Uh, I will say, if you're fishing your big expensive swim baits on 20 pound fluoro, you are going to lose more money. That is just part of it. At some point, you are breaking some baits off. When you throw it on really big gear, that's not as much of a concern. But there's a time and a place for it. If you're in clear water, if your fish are super pressured, lighter line will get more bites, obviously. So I do want to take the time to talk about it. Um, Probably the best rod going right now that I've that I've been putting a lot of time into is the actual the Spro KGB rod uh, for throwing that Chad Chad. I mean, this rod is built specifically for that bait. It's very limber, and I like the Spro rod. They did a good job. Long handle. It's actually longer than I need. It sticks out the back a little bit, but that doesn't matter. Um, long handled. Plenty of rod for lobbing those baits. Again, I'm still going braid to leader. That's just me. But you could throw this on 20, 25 pound fluoro. The rod is extremely parabolic. So if you want to throw some of these baits on 1X hooks, lighter line, you're going to be able to load deep enough to keep those fish pinned. And there's enough guys that want to do this that I wanted to take a minute because I have played with the rods. Even when it's not my style, I go out of my way to try all the gear so that I'm confident, so that I can help people that want to do it that way. And the best rod I've found for doing it is that new Spro rod. That said, I found a budget option too. And that's this guy. So this is from Daiwa uh, in their DX Swimbait series. This is the medium heavy. It's the lightest one in the series. Again, very limber. If you want to go that route, this is like a $99 rod. It's more for the reel, uh, but that rod I think is 99 bucks and it is a super effective rod for fishing that style. And there are some, some baits that need that style. We're gonna get to that one here in a minute. There are just some baits that fish better on that lighter line. They have more action, they move better and they will get a bit more often. Uh, it's just a gamble. It's a cause and effect thing, you've got to decide what's right for you. But if you're one of those guys that's leaning to the lighter end, that's the best, that Spro is the best rod I've found, you know, mid-priced. Uh, and that Daiwa is the best budget rod I've found for that same thing. Um, and actually probably the best higher end. Well, this is more of a true, we'll get to this one. We'll get to this one. We've got a little bit further to go first. All right, let's jump into the multi-jointed baits. The first one is from Mike Buka. It's the Bull Shad. 
The bull shad is just one of those baits that has earned its place. My preferred sizes are either the six inch or the seven inch. I'm not even that concerned on the color. You can throw some of the shad colors, the bone color. Uh, they're all going to fish very similarly and it's a bait that we're fishing so quickly that I don't get that hung up on color. I mean, it's not like they have the most remarkable paint job to start with, uh, but it just doesn't matter. Multi-joint baits, I mean, I already described it with the bluegill, right? These are baits that I want to be fast and aggressive with. Well, except for the armor joint, but we'll get to that. These are baits that I'm burning and pause. Burn, 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 pause. Burn, 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 pause. I want that thing, stop, stop. But that stop, it's not a long pause. It's just a break in cadence. I don't want you getting the idea that I'm burning, 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 and then stopping and this bait is stalling out and just hovering there. That's not it. It's, you know, it's just turning just a little bit and then boom, again. It's just a break in the cadence is all it is. You fish these baits shallow. We're talking less than five foot is the most effective place to fish them. Less than three or four foot, even better. Over the top of grass, along the edges of blown down trees. Uh, places where you know the bass are, you know they're feeding, you know they're aggressive, and you just want to cover water until you get one to lash out. That is a very very effective bait. I like to fish it again, that bigger 1X hardware. This one is a one aught ST36 and a one aught ST36 on that seven inch bait. I mean, that's so much hook for the size of that bait and they can hook on each other just like the others, but they don't because of how fast I'm reeling on it. It's very rare that they cross up and hang up throw it and burn it. It's not every day that the fish want that style of bait. I throw glides nine times out of 10 over a multi-joint, but when they want a multi-joint, I mean, it blows a glide out of the water. When that is the pattern, it is a pure reaction strike. It is such an aggressive way that they feed they massacre those things. The only style of glide that will even come close when they're on that bite is your gizzard style glides. The baits where you're chopping them and being aggressive and those fish are lashing out. That's sort of a crossover. And again, we didn't really have those until the last few years. Uh, so now there's a little bit of crossover. In the past, there was none. There was glides and there was multi-joints and they were two different bites. But again, six inch or seven inch in that bull shad is just such a staple bait. It is so deadly, it just works. The other one, one of the true OG baits is the triple trout. Uh, the triple trout is just such a deadly bait. Now this one, this is a weighted down bait. It's got up, upsized hardware on it. Ignore all that. That's because I've been striper fishing with this bait. Uh, but same deal, stripers love to react. Burn that bait, they, they lose their minds on it. It's awesome. But the triple trout fishes in that same category. Super snaky motion in the water. One thing about both these baits is that uh, if you want it to get more snaky, add a split ring to the nose on either one. If you want it a little bit tighter, no split ring, tie direct, and it will tighten up the action. There's a time and a place for both. If you've got the time, try both. Try it with and without a split ring just to see. Generally, my rule of thumb is if a manufacturer puts the bait in the package with a split ring, I fish it with a split ring. If they don't, I don't. Okay, like S waivers, tie direct. Uh, the Spro, tie direct. The bait Sanities, split ring. Uh, it's up to the manufacturer. You know, they've dialed that thing in. So I tend to match. I mean, I experiment with them, but generally they're doing it for a reason. So I'll tend to match that. But these multi-joints are one where whether they come with them or not, there are times where you're gonna want the split ring on there and times when you don't. It just depends on how erratic you want that bait to be. And again, two, I like to throw either the seven inch or the eight inch in the triple trout and two one-aughts are going to get it done unless you're striper fishing. Well, those are still one-aughts, but those are one-aught VMC 4X hooks. They're mean, mean hooks. 
Last but not least is the Shimano Arma Joint. The Arma Joint came out last year uh, and we crushed them on it in the fall. It came out in a floater first, but it was a floater that if you reeled it would go down a little bit. Uh, but this bait, now they have a slow sink. That's what this is. This is the slow sink and the slow sink is deadly. Uh, in fact, I had a striper. I've been striper fishing a lot lately. I love fishing for striper in the fall. I had a true freak of nature striper break me off on 35 pound and take an arm a joint from me recently. Uh, just brutal for me and the fish. I hate to leave a hook in a fish, but she just owned me. It wasn't for lack of proper gear. I just got owned. Uh, but that arm a joint, you can fish it super fast like that. It'll get real, real tight. But the cool thing about this bait, see how crazy this joint is? I mean, this thing, it's nuts. When you go to cast to this bait, it folds up super tight. So it actually casts extremely well. It doesn't do the big tumble in the air like a lot of glide baits will do. Now, how you throw a glide bait will impact, by the way, like an S waiver is a bait that'll want to tumble a lot, but how you throw it, if you learn to lob them, they do that a lot less than if you hard cast them. Uh, but this Arma joint, I mean, it just folds up and it will go. Uh, so you can get really good distance out of it. This style of bait, these slim, long baits like this, I really like for open water fishing. Uh, spotted bass, small mouth, but of course they crush large mouth too. Uh, but this bait, I really like to burn and pause, burn and pause. And when you pause, I mean, it really will fold up. It gets super dirty so i can also it folds up so much that i can also get really really twitchy with it and fish it more like a cover glide like popping it around grass edges and get fish to lash out in the fall if bass are chasing bait now i'm talking like thread fin if they're chasing larger thread fin shad corralling them in bait pockets or gizzard shad corralling them that's a bait where i can almost like dance it and work it and it just it's very different, uh, but I can also just straight retrieve it and get a great swim out of it. A really cool bait. It's got that Shimano flash boost in it. I don't know how effective that is in this particular bait. Like in the jerk baits, that's out of this world. It works so good. But for how I fish this bait, I'm fishing it so fast and so erratic. There's never a time where they're staring at it. And I think that's making a huge difference for me. Like it does in the jerk baits. In the jerk baits. But here, it's just added flash is all it is. Uh, but it's certainly not taking anything away. They crush that bait. All right, that brings us to top water and then that will wrap up hard baits and we'll talk the rest of the the um, hard bait rods and then we'll switch over we'll talk soft baits hard baits top water baits we're going to start out with tim and i's bait this is the tactical wake okay this we partnered with river to sea to build this bait we wanted to build the best wake bait available and make it available for people uh, we worked for several years to get the price down to where we we really felt good about the price. Uh, we didn't want to overcharge for this bait. We wanted it to be available to people, but we wanted to make a truly different bait. High-end finishes. It comes in a very high-end box. Anybody who's bought one knows that. We wanted to really give that bait a high-end look and feel as well as a very unique fit. Oh, they're blowing up right here. Come on. Oh, dude. I have, they're still chasing. I don't have a single bait tied on. There's got to be something somewhere. He's almost done. We're still going to make a cast over there. Just because we can. This bass just came up chasing a shad four or five times right next to us. This is much larger than what he was eating. But we're still gonna at least make a cast. Come on. Come, on, buddy. Come play.
No love, we're late. That bass has already moved on. He is done chasing that one and moved on down the shoreline. Oh, he came up aggressive. Brutal, brutal. One more just for good measure out in the open. So anyway, on to our wake bait. We worked very hard to create a wake that would resolve a few things. This is the armor joint, by the way. So this is sort of how I like to fish that bait. And you can get even more darty like this with it. But just a straight then pause is how I like to go with that one. All right, we'll leave that here just in case. So the wake. We wanted to create a bait that could do some different things, that would have an amazing, hard, straight swim. Good, loud clack to it. Uh, but one of the things that drives me nuts is when baits don't have a slow swim. And we worked so hard to create the slowest swimming wake bait there is. Uh, and we, we did a lot of things to create that. It took a ton of time fishing in a test tank, watching the bait from above, watching it on underwater cameras, Tim standing alongside the tank, getting a side profile on it and us comparing notes to get this bait to fish at such an insanely slow speed on the surface where there's no V wake whatsoever. You're crawling it. But it's not just dead in the water. It's not just a brick sliding across the surface where it would actually still swim because there are mornings where the lake is glass, where that insanely slow crawl crushes fish. And there were no wakes that could do it effectively, none. So we went out of our way to build that. On that hard clacking swim, we wanted a bait with a better hookup ratio. So we intentionally created this bait. Most wakes swim in the water like this. Very well, actually the water line's up here, right? But it's a very nose down swim and they, they drag a lot of water. So they're very nose down. You'll catch a lot of fish, but you also miss a lot of fish. So we designed this bait to truly swim flat in the water and the water line's way up high on the bait here. So when you fish this thing, most of that bait is down there where they can see it and both hooks are very present. It's not tipped where that front hook is almost completely blocked. It's sitting where the hookup ratio is amazing and then that tail stays sticking up above water. Then we also wanted a bait that could be walked and fished aggressively. So anytime the wind is blowing, you start getting those waves breaking, you're getting a lot of chop, a lot of sound in the water. Instead of waking, you walk it. And it's not a, it's not this kind of walk, right? But it goes pop, 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 pop. Super loud, super aggressive, and it can overcome the sound of those rolling waves and fish can hear and, and hone in on that and target that. We wanted a bait that could do all of those things effectively and we were able to pull it off. Uh, we worked very hard on this and I'm so proud of it. And I'm so proud of the price point that we got it down to. It was originally going to be almost double that price. And we just, Tim and I didn't feel good about it. We worked for years. I say we worked, River to Sea worked for years on ways to get that price down to where it was affordable for everybody. To be able to do things that other baits just cannot do. To be able to do all those things and come in at a super affordable price. I'm so happy with that bait. Now, one thing I do, again, is I change my hardware. The hardware it comes with is bulletproof. We did that on purpose. But I actually lighten my hooks. The reason why is it takes the action one step further. If you want that insanely slow crawl, lighter hooks are going to help you do that. The stock hooks uh, will give it a, an awesome straight swim, but take away from the crazy slow crawl. So I go down ST36 1X hooks, two aught front and back. They're big hooks. You can go down to a one aught in the back if you want. The two aughts are really not necessary. I use it more for balance than anything to help keep that bait as flat as possible. 
uh, so that I have my highest hookup ratio. Uh, but it's a big bait, big hooks. Uh, but those lighter hooks going down to a 1x hook make the bait more lively. And again, it is a large wake bait. We did it on purpose. We knew that if we built a smaller wake bait, we'd sell way more of them. That wasn't a secret. We knew that. The reason why we opted not to do that, we went to a full large size bait like this, is we wanted to force your hand a little bit, to be honest. Uh, we know the power of a wake bait. We know a wake bait's ability to catch an absolute giant in a lot of situations. We knew that if we gave people an option between a medium sized wake and a full size wake, 99% of them would choose the medium. We'd sell way more baits, but the baits are just plain smaller. You're gonna catch a lot more three to five pound fish. You're not gonna catch as many of the true giants. And we wanted people to have a bait that could do different things in different situations and maximize their shot at catching actual double digit class fish. So we opted not to make the smaller one, to force your hand a little bit, to force you to throw a slightly larger bait for your own sake, so that when you cross paths with a freak, she is more likely to eat it. That's why we did that. Maybe down the road somewhere we'll build a smaller one. I don't know, we haven't even had that discussion yet uh, because we really want people to latch on to this size bait, give it that fair shot and see those PBs falling, man. It's awesome. When we get those pictures emailed over or DM to us, I mean, we just light up, man. It's, it's incredible to build a bait for a job and then watch people go out and do that exact thing with it effectively. It's amazing. Now, a couple more baits in this category, the top water category. And the top water, I mean, Fall and spring, it's amazing, but it's awesome all summer. I throw a wake a lot in the summertime around hard structure. I love to fish docks with a wake bait and draw fish out, uh, but all fall, it's a very effective way to fish as well. This guy, the Bait Sanity Tug. We did a dedicated review of this bait. Uh, the tug is not what it looks like. So it is a glide bait. And you can straight swim it and it'll get down just under the surface. And it's got a fantastic glide. It's a very cool bait. But how I like to fish this bait is slower walking on the surface. I use this as a surface walking bait. And it is the only surface walking bait that is a full profile. Uh, it is a, it's a fairly pricey bait because of the detail that went into it. The internal mechanisms to make this bait do some of the really cool things it do it does uh, were not easy. And it's got a bunch of stuff into it. Like see that back hook is sitting on a magnet. So super low profiled. These fins back here are designed to hold scent if you wanna add scent. The mechanism inside it is spring loaded, swiveling hook hangers, uh, and it's spring loaded. So when I'm working this bait and you work it, you don't really walk it. It's all with the reel to get it to. And when it fishes, it, it's, not, it's not a super spook. It's not up there on the surface just slinging. What it does is it dips underwater and then comes up. Dips underwater and comes up. Dips underwater, comes up. But then you can get aggressive with that cadence and load this spring that's in the nose, hear it in there knocking. You can load that spring in the turn and it'll cause the bait to jump out of the water. It's, it's awesome. It's a very different uh, and it's very subtle and it crushes fish. It's a very, very cool bait. If you like throwing big walking baits, uh, this is very different than anything you have thrown before. I fish it with one X, one aught hooks. Uh, of course, upgraded split rings like always. Uh, but a very, very effective bait. And you can fish it as a glide bait too, very close to the surface, but that's not what I use it for. I love to get that swooping surface thing going to get those fish to react. Then last but not least is going to be a rat style bait, another wake bait. This is the PB Rat. Uh, and this is a bait that we've talked about a lot in both the single and double joint. So of the rat baits, this is my favorite. It is a very effective bait. Uh, but what I actually wanted to bring up is that they came out with the little guy, the little mouse. And this dude, 
Like it's the perfect size for just crushing fish. You know, I talked about not building a smaller weight because we were trying to stay away from those smaller fish to help people catch a freak of nature. But a lot of people want to catch those fish. We understand that. Um, so here with the rat, they came out with that smaller size. And I mean, it's drastically different. These are both the, the three piece double joints. Look how much smaller that thing is. This is the exact right size. I'm going to set the rat down like it's, this is the exact right size to light fish up with a little mouse or rat style bait. It's a very, very fishy size. Uh, it's got size two one X hardware. You can just leave that on it. Um, adjust your gear accordingly. Of course you can go to heavier hardware if you want to, uh, but it's just a smaller profile. It's going to catch a lot of fish in that two to five pound range. It'll still catch some bigger ones, but if you want to up your confidence in a rat, you want to get more bites. You're a tournament guy. You can't eliminate those smaller bites. Like they needed to come out with this bait for a long time. And I, I'm super stoked that they did. I think it was the right move uh, for them and for the average angler um, to just create a bait that will catch way more fish in an outing. It's a really, really good size. I think that was great. That wraps up hard baits. Uh, as far as rods go, I've got two more rods and they're the two rods that I use most often. Uh, my main rod that I fish swim baits on, be it hard swim baits or soft baits, is the G Loomis and the IMX Pro line. It's the 966 SWBR, the 966 swim bait rod. Uh, that rod is one of the only crossover rods on the market where it can throw both treble hooked baits and soft swim baits, jig hook baits effectively. It's very hard to find a rod that can do both. Basically it's impossible. Uh, but this is the one rod that I have that can do it. I mean, there's three of them sitting here on the deck. I use this rod a ton, an absolute ton. Uh, I this one's set up for striper at the moment, but I've got the Calcutta Conquest MD on it, 50 pound liter, which is a little ridiculous, but this reel is amazing, by the way. My main reel is the Tranks. Let me, this is a jumbled mess over here. But my main reel is a Tranks, Tranks 300. Uh, in the past, it was a Calcutta 400, but when the Tranks came along with that power handle, I mean, that just changed everything. The Tranks is my bread and butter. That's my baby. But I have been putting a lot of time in to this Calcutta Conquest MD, and it's got these big oversized handles on it too. If you want a high-end swim bait reel, this reel is out of this world. I love this thing. I've caught a ton of giant fish on it since I got it, and I've been so happy with it. This style of handle up to true power handles, whether that's a Tranks, or Alexa, sorry, that's a Tatula, or Alexa with a power handle. You'll never understand the reason for a power handle until you hook a giant fish on one. When I hook a big large mouth on a standard handle, it's a battle. When I hook them on a power handle, it's like I've turned a winch on. It is completely different. You just have so much more power. You really do. You have so much more ability to drag those fish it's incredible. So I'm a huge advocate of the, of the Tranks or the Lexa uh, or that Calcutta MD, that uh, anything that's got that big oversized handle where you can really force those fish. Then the last rod is this one here. Again, Tranks with a power handle, but this is from St. Croix. This is in the Victory series. It's their Swimbait Ranger, uh, which is the 710 Heavy Fast. This is probably my favorite rod for throwing mid-size glides and all the wake baits. It is very effective. It is, let's call it halfway in between my 966 and this softer style of glide bait rod. It's in between them. But the benefit of it is that it has that softer tip. So when I'm throwing these baits, like I love to throw the wake around docks, the softer tip in that rod 
makes it a lot more accurate. I'm not smashing baits on docks. I'm able to feather them in and land them right where I want them very, very effectively. Uh, and then again, it's sort of halfway in between. So it loads super deep when I hook them on those treble hooks, but I still get into some horsepower down here where I can really drag them. Uh, and then otherwise I'm using that Loomis 966. But the 966, it's an incredibly popular rod and it's really hard to get your hands on. They're sold out a lot. I checked the other day, there are a few in stock, but that doesn't mean that by the time you see this, get in the description and click the link that they'll still be there. I don't know if they will be or not. You should definitely look. Um, but if not, you've got some other awesome options. Now, we've still got to talk about some stouter rods and some budget rods and stuff, but that's with the soft baits. All right, I'm gonna check my batteries again and we are jumping into soft baits. When it comes to soft baits, I basically have three categories uh, and then some little subsets within that. But we've got bluegill style baits, they speak for themselves. Then we've got paddle tails and we've got wedge tails, okay? Here's a mag draft, paddle tail. Here's a savage gear with a wedge tail. The difference in these tail designs uh, is how they move water. A paddle tail style tail is going to be a very wide kick in almost every situation. Uh, they're more aggressive, uh, very high vibration if you speed them up. I mean, they really thump hard. You can even feel it in the rod tip sometimes versus a wedge style tail, which tends to be very tight, just a just a little wiggle essentially, just wagging back there behind that bait. Traditionally, I throw paddle tails in warmer water, I throw wedge tails in colder water, although I will say that more and more and more I throw paddle tails most of the time. Um, wedge tails, it's so tight of an action, it requires realism to fool a fish into biting, where I think paddle tails a lot of times, it's a, I can hear blow ups around the corner right here, but I can't quite see them. If they come close again, we're gonna stick one of those fish. Uh, the paddle tails, they're a little more aggressive, they move more water, I think they pull fish from farther, uh, and they they trigger a bite a little bit more. And a lot of your you know shad minnows uh, those types of fish have a more aggressive swim to them. Like a gizzard shad, super aggressive. Thread fin's a little bit tighter, but like a trout is a very, very methodical action until they take off like a rocket to get away. So wedge tails tend to be a better imitator of uh, trout and kokanee, whereas paddle tails in most situations are a better imitator of shad and other bait fish. And then bluegill, they're just sort of their own animal. Uh, let's start out with paddle tails. There's a bunch of baits here, but I separate them uh, basically into three things. We've got treble hook baits, we have jig hook baits, and then we have weedless baits. And with that in mind, it's very small, the category. Uh, for treble hook baits, for me, it's a mag draft. Six inch mag draft, eight inch mag draft. Of course, the 10 is great as well, uh, but I put the vast majority of my time into the six and the eight. Probably the biggest thing about a mag draft, it's simple to fish. You throw them out, you wind them back. With a mag draft, you wanna throw it out there and find its perfect speed. It has a perfect speed speed. It's got one speed where that bait really sets up well and that tail is back there wagging and the body gets a rock to it. That is the magical speed. That's what you're looking for. You're not going to force the bait to do a lot of other things. You're not going to force it to burn super high in the column. Uh, you're not going to force it and crawl it super deep. You can slow down and get it deep, uh, but you'll give up some of that action to do so. Now, as far as six inch versus eight inch, when do I throw which? You would probably be surprised to find out that I actually prefer to throw the eight. I prefer to throw the larger bait. I think that this bait has more drawing power. It will pull fish from farther and it will catch more 
giant. So I spend a ton of time with the eight. I think it is the better bait. That said, the six crushes. Fantastic beginner bait. It is also a fantastic advanced bait. It just plain catches them. I throw the six when I'm fishing around smallmouth or spotted bass or when I'm exploring a new lake. The six is just a deadly size uh, and I can cover a ton of water with it. I can be aggressive with it. One thing about the six is I, I do some things with it that are abnormal. Uh, so you find that perfect speed, right? But I have a tendency, I think it's because I throw other baits so much, I don't always even know when I'm real bumping baits. Like I'll be out fishing with somebody and they're like, you told me to straight retrieve. Why are you bumping yours? I'm like, oh, I didn't even know I was bumping it. It's just built into me. I've been doing this for so long with an S waiver and adding my twitches. It's like, I can't turn the twitches off in the same. I just, I real bump a lot of baits, even when I don't mean to. But I found with a mag draft that it works, that I catch a lot of fish right after I real bump it. And it's funny because it doesn't do anything. The bait's swimming along, it's got that swim. And when you real bump it, all it does is like throw it off balance for a second. But it, it seems to be like the twitch in a glide bait. If they're following that thing and I knock it off balance for a second, that's when they pop it. It's really interesting. Uh, so there is a little bit of something there that you can add once in a while. Don't do it a lot because again, it doesn't look great. It just seems to work, but I wouldn't do it throughout a cast. Once, maybe twice in a cast, give it a little bump. If you get bit doing that, then you know that's something you can add in that day. If it's not working at all, just stop doing it. Just straight retrieve. Now the eight inch bait for me is just a slow roller. I just slow roll that bait, but man, it works. It crushes them. I catch so many big ones on this. As we have moved east uh, and explored more fisheries, the mag draft, my confidence in a mag draft, I'm getting mosquito bites, my confidence in a mag draft has just gone off the charts, off the charts. When I was on Clear Lake, the glide bait was way, 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 way above a paddle tail. And as I'm exploring lakes out here, it's sort of the opposite. I start with a paddle tail, which in reality, I start with a mag draft, and then I go to a glide. Uh, just a, a different deal. A lot of these fisheries out here, the primary things these fish are eating are shad, whether that's threadfin shad or gizzard shad. And that is just a very effective way to fish them or to target them. Uh, I like to fish a lot of the white type color. So white back shad is one of my favorites, but you're gonna see me throw a lot of the shad and trout colors too. Uh, there's a lot of really good options in the line. Over the last year or two, I've really expanded. I used to throw white back shad and albino pearl shad, period. Now I throw a lot of the trouts and a lot of the other shad colors. Uh, and I do really well on all of them. I'm constantly adapting too as an angler uh, and I'm building confidence in more of those colors and in more situations. You wouldn't believe the places, little tiny creeks and giant reservoirs where I crush them on an eight inch mag draft. It's awesome. Now, one thing on both of these baits, six inch and eight inch, I don't fish the stock hooks. On the six inch, it's that three X, the owner ST56 size two, okay? I switch it out from a stock 1X hook to that 3X hook so that I can pull on them. And I do catch a lot of big fish on the bait, so I want that stronger hook. On the eight inch, I'm very specific. I hook more fish if I change that hook out. I do. And the hook that I use is the ST36, the 1X hook in a two aught size. The stock hook is a two aught. But, and I will fish the stock hook, but the second I dole it up at all, I change it out and I switch to that ST36 2 aught. That specific hook for that eight inch bait. The rest of this hardware is fine. I leave it the same, but as soon as I ding that treble hook, oh, that, that one's actually already been changed right there. The second I ding it up at all, this is the hook that goes on. This one isn't stock, that is the ST36. But I change that out. One other thing about a mag draft, if you want to extend the life of the bait, because I see people complain about like magnets coming out and having issues and they do all these crazy systems where they pin the hooks down and 
All I do is I stick this hook in there and I send it. But if I'm gonna fish docks, like I wanna skip it, or after I thrash the bait and now it's beat up, when I put it in here, cause there's a, there's a slot that that hook is sitting in. When I stick it in the slot, I just lean to one side or the other of the slot and skin hook. And now it's stuck in there. Now it's hooked into the actual plastic. And you can move that hook around quite a bit. Like for days, you can move it around and just stab different places and get it to bite. Because I like to take that mag draft and fish it in open water. The eight inch, it'll fish great in the same places that a, an explorer will fish. You know, over the top of island tops, long tapering points, pulling fish out from under docks. It can do all those things effectively but I also take this bait and I skip it a lot. So I'll move that hook over, stab it into the material so that it's stuck there and then skip docks with it. Pop, 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 back up under those docks. I light fish up under docks with these things because I don't think a lot of people do it. And then same exact thing with the six inch. The six inch, I'm fishing tighter to cover, uh, smaller quarters, but I do the same thing. I skip with that bait a lot too. Now, that's it for treble hooks. There are a lot of other great treble hook baits, but it, the mag draft works so well for me that I just keep it super simple. For jig hook baits, I have two. We've got the burrito and we've got the JSJ. We'll come back to that. The Buka burrito, this bait is crazy. It crushes Fish. It crushes fish so well. It came out in all sorts of colors, but none of those colors were perfect for what Tim and I wanted to do. But the bait is so deadly effective that we actually reached out to Mike Buka and did our own color. And this is called Tactical Shad. And that is the main color we throw. Uh, we really talked to them and they built a bait uh, for everybody to have a color option, right? It's widely available. It's in a local shop to you. But we did it so we would have the color to throw. It's a blend between a Tennessee shad and an electric shad. And it is hands down my favorite color in the burrito. This is the five inch burrito. This is the six inch. The five inch is a small bait, but it crushes big ones. Even though it's a little bait, like it's hardly bigger than a 4.8 Kitek this way, but it's much taller, much thicker. It's overall presence is much larger then the bait itself appears. And then the six inch is just that much bigger again. We destroy fish with these things, it's crazy. These things are so effective in a variety of situations, it's incredible. Uh, I bottom crawl them a lot, throw them out. You know, everything from bottom crawling in the winter, like I said, I'm throwing wedge tails, or boot tails more than I used to. In places where I traditionally throw a wedge tail, bottom crawling in the winter, all the way to like ledge fishing in the summer, throwing out, letting it hit bottom and then winding it along the bottom. Uh, it's remarkable how well they work. And my size choice is just how big are the bait fish that either I just historically know these fish are chasing uh, or I physically in the summertime see them chasing, like chasing them out of the water uh, or I've seen one spit one up or one's been in their mouth. I'm just trying to match the size of what they're really eating. And then little spoiler alert, Tim and I have been working on a couple more colors with Mike in the bullshit, or excuse me, in the burrito uh, to make it even more effective in more situations. So those aren't quite done yet, uh, but we'll be here super soon. So definitely be checking back for new tactical colors to pop up. Next up, we've got that JSJ. This is called the Loose Caboose. Again, just an unbelievable bait. Uh, there are so many good baits that have come out in the last few years on the glide bait end and on the soft bait end. I mean, the burrito has just taken over a lot of soft bait fishing for me. The mag draft, which has been around a while, just continues to grow in my arsenal. And now the loose caboose uh, is another one that is just out of this world. JSJ Baits builds this loose caboose. Uh, JSJ has been around forever. He's one of the original swim bait makers. He's been doing it forever. He's built a ton of incredible designs through the years, but hands down out of every bait that he has ever made, I believe the loose caboose to be his best 
bait. It is the most effective bait in the most situations. I fish it just like I fish the burritos. One thing I forgot to add about both of these baits is that they can thump. If you speed them up, they thump so hard, you feel them in the rod. I mean, you feel that tail thumping. These are very, very aggressive baits. Where the loose caboose fits in for me. So the burrito comes in a five and a six. The mag draft comes in the six and the eight. The loose caboose is right in between. It's a seven inch bait. Jig hook bait, awesome paddle tail on that thing. And it's a it's made of a more stretchy material, super durable. I am not going through baits. I'm fishing the same baits over and over and over and over and over. So you have to pay more, same with the burritos. You have to pay more for them because these baits are made out of silicone, not plastisol, okay? But that causes them to be super stretchy, super forgiving. They're not getting ripped and torn up like traditional soft plastic baits. Cost goes way up. When a designer decides to build out of silicone, the actual material cost is drastically more than plastisol. So you have to pay more for the baits, but the baits last way longer. We get asked all the time why the burritos cost what they cost. That's why, they're silicone baits. Same with the loose caboose. But this is a seven inch bait. It fits right between a burrito and a mag draft for me. And it fishes all those situations. I've done great with this thing. Bottom crawling in 20 to 25 foot. Uh, in fact, I caught a monster striper just the other day. I have been on a striper kick. I've already given that up. I have. And I caught a monster the other day crawling this thing in 25 foot of water. Just dong just clobbered that thing uh, but i've also done incredibly well taking this same bait and skipping docks with it up shallow like two to five foot it's got just the right weighting and balancing that i can throw it up under docks and swim that thing but i can also throw it out and let it sink deep and crawl it it does both extremely well. I'm so stoked on that bait. That is one of those soft baits that is just so universal. And the fact that it's a silicone bait and it's super durable is even better. Like I said, it's the best bait that I've ever seen Josh put out. And he has put out some amazing baits through the years. So we've got treble hook baits, we've got jig hook baits, and then finally we've got weedless baits. When it comes to weedless baits, I have two main baits. We've got the mag draft again, and then we've got the Scottsboro, okay? With the mag draft, this guy, so both of these baits, let's back up. The weedless baits are designed with a hook slot, so they open up, and we can put a big jig hook in them, but the baits themselves remain weedless. You can take it and you can just skin hook that hook point. And now we can throw this thing right through a laid down tree. If you want to skip docks with it so that you don't hook junk under the docks, you can do that. Because occasionally I lose one of these expensive baits because I'll skip it back under a dock with an exposed hook and I don't know there's a cross beam back there. Um, so you can fish them under docks. They fish amazing around weeds. So this mag draft, this is called the mag draft freestyle. That's the one that's unrigged and it's got the belly slot in it. And then in the Scottsboro, this is a six inch bait. In the Scottsboro, I like to throw both the six inch and the seven inch. Now with both of these baits, there's two hooks that I use. This is the Owner Beast, okay? My preferred size in the Owner Beast for both baits is the eight aught. Um, the eight aught in either a half, if I'm fishing shallow, I use the half. If I'm fishing deep, I go to the three quarter. Uh, both work extremely well, but that three quarter is a sleeper. A lot of people don't think to do that, to fish a weedless bait down deep. Um, and then the other one from BKK, we've got this guy, and this is an unreal hook. This whole system can be adjusted and moved. And then we've got that underspin blade on there as well. So again, I'll link the hooks in the video description um, right with the baits. I'll give you baits, then hooks. And again, if there's any problems in that video description, if you go to our actual website, tacticalbassin.com, uh, that description 
will be complete. But both of these, so that guy, the owner beast, if I want just a straight swim bait hook, and then this guy from BKK, if we want that underspin blade, because there are days where they want one over the other, and it's nice to have the option to add that flash. That's it for paddle tails. Uh, let's talk bluegill, and then we'll end with wedge tails, okay? Bluegill baits, I'm gonna keep it super simple. Um, I say that, I've got four of them. First one is obviously gonna be that Savage Gear we already talked about, that line through bait. We don't need to go super in depth there, we've already talked about it. But again, I love to fish it with the hook on the bottom. That's when it is the most stable. And it's got that awesome swim. It's a fantastic size too, they can get the whole thing in. One other Savage Gear is the RTF. RTF with Savage Gear stands for ready to fish. In other words, it's got a jig hook in it. The little RTF bluegill. He's small, it's a downsized profile, but I crush with this thing. If you're a pond guy, uh, it, it is such an effective bait, although so is this one. <laughs> Both are really good options, but you can see the size difference there. Both are great baits. And then on the jig hook side, full size, it's gonna be the mat lures. I prefer the hammer tail. With all of these baits, I use wedge style tails. I just like the way that a wedge style tail looks on a bluegill bait. I like that tight action. When I see bluegills take off through the water, it's like their body is hardly moving, but this little tail is back there, right? That's, and that's how they go. It's not like this big S thing, like a gizzard shad. So I like the way that little wedge tail is back there behind that full size body. Uh, so if I want a jig hook, it's that mat lures with the hammer tail on it. Then if I want to go weedless, it's 13 fishing. This guy, this one's weedless and you cannot believe the size of the hook that we hide inside that bait. That's an eight aught owner beast. And I bend it a little bit. Notice how bent it is, it's actually bent a lot. But I do that because when I put that in here, let me poke it back through. When I put that in here, that gives me a profile where the hook is tipped up. You'll see what I mean. If this was stock, the hook angle is down like this, matching the body. For a bass to hook up, they have to completely crush the bait to get that hook. I don't like that. I want, if those fish breathe on that thing, I wanna get them. So this bait, when I bend that hook up, the second I crush the bait at all, do you see the hook point coming out? It's up and out, up and out. So any skin that comes up the back of that bait will catch on that hook point and I've got them. It just increases my hookup ratio. It's hard enough for a bass to eat a bluegill profiled bait. If they eat it, I want to stick them. So it's just a little trick. Take a pair of pliers, bend that owner beast just a little. Obviously when you bend a hook out, your hookup ratio goes up but your ability to land them goes down. So it's very important when you when you bend that hook out that if you stick one, you horse them. There's no game plan, there's no letting them jump. Get those fish in the boat or they will kick it out. But your hookup ratio is going to go way, way, way up. Now that brings us to the wedge tails. The most famous of the wedge tails, hands down, is the Huddleston. The Huddleston Deluxe. And if I could only have one Huddleston for the rest of my life, it would be the one that I caught my PB on, as well as a lot of other double digits. My biggest bass on an eight inch ROF 12 Huddleston is 17.2 pounds. Uh, she will be my PB forever, most likely. Just an incredible fish. And we've told that story in other videos, the whole story, because it is a crazy one. Uh, but that fish ate an eight inch HUD ROF 12. That's rate of fall 12 with a jig hook. That is my favorite Huddleston. Uh, again, if I could only have one forever, it would be that one. I have the most confidence in it. This style of bait, that wedge tail style, swims at insanely slow speeds and in insanely cold water. And that's important to understand that a swim bait kicks differently in warm water and cold water. So a bait that 
swims great in summer, may not swim at all in winter if the plastic is too rigid, uh, if it's too hard. The softer the plastic, the better it swims in winter. Wedge tails swim incredibly well in that cold winter water. That's why they're so effective in winter. However, that's not the only way I fish them. I have two different retrieves that I use with a Huddleston or a similar style wedge bait. Uh, I have my crazy slow crawl, and you, we're gonna get to that, because that is, you need to see that crawl. So when we're done talking about baits and rods, I'm gonna actually stand up, set a tripod up, I'll make a few casts. I don't think we're gonna get any bites here. We're in the back of a cove, right? Uh, I'm not trying to get bit. I'm trying to show you the retrieves. I'll show you how slow I'm talking for a dead of winter crawl, but I'll also show you my faster speed because I fish a Huddleston or this style of bait different than a lot of people. Uh, I actually like to fish them quickly as well with a pretty aggressive retrieve. It's slightly faster than natural. I'll explain that when we get to it. But you got the eight inch, which is an incredibly effective bait. Then for the guy who wants to downsize a little bit, you've got the HUD 68, which is the six inch bait with the eight inch tail. Same exact tail as the eight inch. That's a very effective bait as well. But again, if I could only have one, it's 100%, it's the eight inch. More drawing power, bigger fish. The other bait that has come to market that is incredibly effective is from Savage Gear. This is their eight inch RTF, ready to fish. Comes with a jig hook. It actually comes with a stinger hook as well, pre-rigged. Uh, I take those off and then I do my own and I'll talk about that in a second. But this again is an amazing, amazing bait that I have crushed them with. That eight inch RTF in the fast sink is the one. That's the bait that I rely on. And I love this color as well. It looks so good. It's got that similar glitter to our tactical shad. Uh, such an amazing, I'll list this color first. When I list the bait, I'll give you a favorite color and it'll be this one. Uh, such a cool, cool bait. Now again, it comes with a stinger hook rigged on it. And I used to fish that stock stinger hook, but I have now had two bend out on really, really big bass. And that is just not cool. Uh, so I have started doing my own stingers on them. I build my stingers. If you're going to use a stinger, this is what I use, single strand wire, single strand, and then you do a haywire twist. So I literally just twist the wire. There's no knot, there's no crimps, there's none of that stuff to fail. It's a haywire twist and it is bulletproof. So I use that same 3X size two hook that you see me use so much, that is my stinger hook. And then I put that back here, hang that in, and we're set. Now, I prefer to fish these baits with just a jig hook. I only add a stinger if I feel like I have to, if I'm getting short strikes. If you are going to add a stinger to any bait, any soft bait, again, we're talking about taking care of our resource, taking care of these fish. Please, 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 Add your stinger hook on the top back of the bait, not the bottom back of the bait. The Magdraft has a belly hook. That is one of the only belly hooks I fish on a soft bait. It's far enough forward that I've got a great hookup ratio. I never, ever, ever add a stinger to the bottom of this bait. This works well as is. Never go farther back than that. If you have to go farther back, go on the back. The reason why is that a small largemouth, it won't get the whole bait. But the true giant, the day you hook your 10, 11, 12, 13 pounder, she's gonna inhale this bait whole. And the last thing you want is that belly stinger in the back to be all the way down in her gills, just ripping them to pieces, shredding that fish and killing her. It is a horrible feeling to have a giant fish die while you're standing there looking at it. It is not, as bad as we want to catch them, I would rather not catch them than have that happen. Seriously, it is not a good feeling. Uh, we want to take care of that resource. So if you put a stinger back on the back, 
Again, single strand wire, haywire twist right down the back. Then that hook point will stick them in the roof of the mouth 95% of the time, not in the gills. And that's okay. You can reach back there, pop it right out. So if you're going to do a stinger, go down the back. The last wedge tail bait, for that matter, the last swim bait that we're going to talk about is this guy, the Matt Lures Shad. Uh, it is the only shad style bait that I throw with a wedge style tail. And I talk about it simply because I have crushed them on it. I've done really, really well with this bait in places where bass are eating gizzard shad. It's a jig hook bait. It's got a belly uh, attachment point, but I do not add a belly hook at all. Just fish that jig hook. It's plenty small for him to eat it whole. Works really well. Um, year round. You don't have to just fish wedge style tail baits in the winter. They can work really good in summer too, but I will say in summer, they don't have as much drawing power as a paddle tail. A paddle tail will pull fish from farther. So I tend to throw wedge tails in the colder water months. I tend to crawl them, but like I said, I have two different speeds and we're about to get to that. Uh, let's wrap up the rods. We'll talk line really quick. And then I'm going to set the cameras up and I'm actually going to show you how I fish some of these baits. So for rods, the rods that I really use day in and day out, that Loomis 966 again is my bread and butter. That's my main rod because I can throw everything with it. But my dedicated rod for throwing soft baits, I discovered this one last year. This is from Shimano and their Zodius line. So not a super expensive rod either. This is the Zodius 7.9 Extra Heavy. This thing is a beast. I mean, you want to hit a fish and drag them. This is your rod. It's crazy how strong this rod is. But it has just enough tip section that it actually works really well. I would not throw hard baits with treble hooks on it. But I do throw the eight inch mag draft on it with incredible results. It's my favorite rod for fishing the eight inch mag draft. It's, it's an amazing rod and it's pretty darned affordable. Now granted, I have mine with the Tranks on it, which is a pricey reel, uh, but you can drop it down to a Corrado, Corrado 300, and that's a phenomenal combo too. You just don't have that power handle. Now on the more budget end, on the budget side, I've got two for you uh, because guys are always looking for budget swim bait gear. And I understand that. Swim bait fishing in general is expensive, but you never, ever, ever want to skimp on your rod, reel, line, hooks. And the reason why is you can do everything else right. You can spend a fortune on the baits. You can spend a fortune on the travel and the time to fish these baits. And then when you finally get your monster bite, if your gear wasn't right, you lose her. The good news is in recent years, the rods, the budget rods have come so far, so far. And I have two that I really, really like. From 13 fishing in the Defy Black line, that's the eight foot heavy. The heavy is a fantastic jig hook slash soft bait rod. I really like it. I have that paired up to the 13 Fishing A3, which is a reel that I have been so, so impressed with. I've got a couple of them and I've put a lot of time into that reel. And I've got to say, the thing that I look for in a swim bait reel is straight power and that it doesn't break down over time. Because you can put a lot of money into a swim bait reel and then a year later, the baits have beat it up. The weight of the baits and that reel is grinding. And that just takes away from your fishing experience. And that A3 has held up really well for me over time. I've been very impressed with that one. Then the other one is from Shimano in their SLX line. So both of these are right around a hundred bucks. Uh, in, the SLA, in the SLX, it's a 7.8 Heavy. Uh, and I have, I mean, I have put this rod through the paces uh, with both largemouth and striper uh, and some other species. 
uh, just, I beat this rod to death because I wanted to find a really good budget alternative. I wanted to have more than one really good budget rod. So I needed to know if it could take the abuse and it can. Again, this is a jig hook rod. So I'm throwing the burrito on it. I'm throwing the weedless baits on it. I'm throwing uh, the Huddleston and the Savage gear. I'm not crossing over into the glide baits with this rod. Uh, this is specifically for those bigger soft baits, but a very effective rod. And I've got that one paired up to a Shimano Cardiff, which is also a budget friendly reel. The Cardiff, as you thrash it through the years, will start to get a little bit of that feel, right? It'll start to get a little grindy through the years, uh, but its strength remains. So if you need to keep your swim bait fishing on a budget, that's a true 300 size reel, uh, that is not going to cost you the fish when you finally hook them up. But if you can upgrade to one of these other reels, especially to something with a power handle, I recommend it. But that SLX, that pairing is fantastic. Now, I fish a lot of braid to leader. Uh, at a minimum, I use 65 pound braid on all my swim baits. I actually prefer 80 pound. That seems crazy to a lot of people, you just have to trust me on this. When I get online and I see people throwing a fit about fishing swim baits on braid, I break baits off it's because they don't understand braid. I don't have to talk to that person to know they were fishing 40 or 50 pound braid. That's what happened. They might've even been lighter than that. If you fish light braid and you cast giant baits, it will dig in and it will cut itself and you will send those baits. If you go to 65 and especially if you go to 80, you will never ever ever cast a bait off. It just doesn't happen. And guys are like, well, why would I use 80 pound for a bass? It's not for the bass. It's for casting the big baits. And I know this from experience, right? I've guided for years and years and years, taking out some professional level anglers and some beginner anglers and letting all of them throw multi hundred dollar swim baits of mine. And my baits don't get lost. And you cannot believe the backlashes I have picked out for people. You cannot imagine. Never does that 80 pound braid get cut. And if you use Power Pro Max Quattro, that 80 pound is actually the size of 65 pound. So you're even better off. Uh, but the two braids that I use a lot are Power Pro Max Quattro, and then I use Suffix 832. Both of those are fantastic braids. The leaders I tie on them most often are these. Uh, Sunline System Shock Leader, fluorocarbon, mono okay uh, i use a lot of 30 and 35 pound leader now granted sunline is like japanese rated line not us rated line so a 35 pound us line is really like 50 or 60 pound line they just say it's 35. the japanese actually use a sizing system so a 35 pound jdm line is a much smaller diameter than a 35 pound US line. So keep that in mind. When I say 35, you're thinking rope and it's a lot smaller than that. Uh, but these are incredibly effective. I use the mono for my top water and I use the fluorocarbon for basically everything else. But 30 to 35 pound is just bulletproof. And these fish, they're looking at the baits. When I'm fishing these baits, they I don't believe that they see the braid and that fluoro or that mono leader very often because they are looking at the swim bait and the swim bait is big enough to capture their attention and then they come to the swim bait they don't look in front of the swim bait at the line we learned that with an alabama rig right the day that chandelier came out and bass would eat that thing was the day we realized they were looking at their target not in front of the target so don't be afraid to upsize your line now again some guys I'm preaching to the choir and some guys are on that 20 pound fluoro train and I get it, I'm not gonna argue it, uh, but I prefer braid to heavy leader. All right, with that, let's shift gears. Let me get set up, tie a few of these baits on and we'll go through some of these unique retrieves so you can get a feel for really how to fish these baits effectively. All right, I got a bunch of baits rigged up here for you. We're gonna start out with the glide baits. Uh, one thing about swim baits is this is such a power technique that a lot of people forget that there's a lot of finesse involved in this as well. So the first bait up is that Spro Chad Shad. 
This is a bait that we're going to want to walk underwater. Now, granted, we can steady swim it too, but we want to get that good chop out of that bait. And we're going to do that by chopping the reel. Let me throw this bait out here. Now, it's easy in your mind to think that this would all be power, and it's just not. Here's what chopping this bait looks like without overworking it. Barely bumping that reel. Now I can add the rod to it and it gets even more subtle. Barely, barely bumping that thing, but it's easier just to work it with the reel by itself. Bump, 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 bump. And that's it. And this bait is over here. I don't know. If I throw it the other way, maybe you can see it. I don't know. It's, it's walking down the side of that boat. Now I can straight retrieve it too. And this is on that spro rod, so super soft. I just load that thing up and let it go. If I wanna just straight retrieve it, here's my retrieve speed to get that out of it. And it's got a good swim, but it's best when I'm chopping that reel handle. Super simple bait to work, super simple. Next up. Let's look at that bait sanity, that chimera shad. That bait there. Tighten my reel just because this would be the time one would freight train it. The chimera shad is amazing on a straight retrieve. Just like that, it's thumping the rod trap. Bump, 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 bump. On my rod tip right now, it swims so hard. But again, it's all about those gentle bumps. This one takes a bigger bump than the Spro does because it's a bigger bait. But as I'm doing this bump, that bait is going full 180 degrees side to side, all the way across, full turn, full turn, full turn. It's incredible, let me see. Again, I don't know if you guys can see down the side of the boat or not, but it is making full 180 turns on the surface with those reel bumps. Really a remarkable bait. That is one of the better glides. That and the Spro, some of the best glides to come out in forever. A complete other end of the spectrum, also a bait sanity, but I tied this one on so I could show you a big open water glide. The idea with an open water glide is that you're getting that much, much wider, much slower swim out of that bait. I'll tend to fish this bait a little more rod up just to help guide it. And it's just super slow. But again, it's more finessey than you think. If this was an S waiver and I want to chop that reel, I'd be hitting it like this, right? Reeling my bait, boom, boom. Reeling my bait, boom, boom. That's making this thing blow out and look terrible. If I want an open water glide to jump out and do that cadence change, I'm going to be reeling along nice and slow, getting the big swim out of it and then Bump, bump, continue. It's all in the reel. I don't even need my rod. Bump, bump. If I want to do it with my rod, let me step back so you can see the whole rod. It's going to be super subtle. I just touch, touch. That's it. One, two, three, four, touch touch one two three four touch touch very subtle wide glide followed by big wide slides out to the side okay very very subtle i think a lot of people overwork these baits that's why i want you to see this in person how Again, on an S waiver, pop, pop, you know, or hard bumps to that handle. 
but on that big open water glide it's just touch touch that's it even on that chad chad just bump 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 to get the best action out of it now here's our wake bait we've done videos showing you how to throw the wake before but i'm going to show you these retrieves If I just want that good steady weight, cause that's the main deal. Rod tip up a little bit, help guide that nose. And right there, I'm getting the best swim out of that bait. It's just clack, 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 coming across the surface of the water. If I want to break my cadence to give it a little something, that was it. It's a little cadence break. That's enough for that bait kicking to just kick a little bit. And if there's a follower, that's when they'll smoke it. Let me show you that again. I'm swimming that bait along, cadence break. It's not a bump, it's just a stop. Cadence break. It's not a long pause. Now, if I want, let me show you that bait coming along the boat. Perfect swim, loud knock. Now, if I want to walk that bait, it's just like walking the dog, like walking any other fast top water. So my rod tip, let me back up so you can see that rod. I'm bumping the rod, bump, 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 and I'm chopping the handle. Chop, 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 chop. And I do them together. Chop, 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 chop. And that's causing the bait to walk back and forth i'm gonna try and show you on the side of the boat i'm not sure i can do it backhanded i've never tried super aggressive super erratic just slinging water not something you want to do while it's calm it's something you want to do when the waves are crashing and there's commotion in the water. When it's calm, you just want that steady swim. Now, to truly slow crawl the bait, let me see how slow I can get her going. Just creeping that thing. And it's just ever so slowly, ever so slowly crawling on the surface. Super slow. This is for those dead, dead calm mornings. That's all you gotta do. Very, very simple. Those are the retrieves that we use for the tactical wake. What do we have over here? All right, one more hard bait and then two soft baits and we'll wrap it up. This is the bull shad. Again, this is a multi joint bait. So this could be the bull shad, the triple trout. Uh, it could be the bull gill. They're all going to get a similar retrieve. It might take me a cast to get the retrieve. It is hard to be switching between all these baits and keeping track of retrieves. Let me have a look here. Oh, we got it. Just like that. So burn, pause, burn, pause. But can you see how short the pause is? It's not like I'm, it's not like I'm stopping this thing. And I can tighten it up too. I can go like this. Let's send it the other way. Maybe you can see it. I don't know if you guys could see that way or not. Can you see how good that looks? Burning and pausing, burning and pausing. That's the trick with those multi-joint hard baits. All right, that brings us to soft baits. The mag draft, here's an eight inch mag draft. 
Now, all I'm gonna do here is try and find the sweet spot in the retrieve and show you what that speed is. That's all I'm doing here. The mag draft isn't a whole lot to see on a retrieve because we're really not changing it up. Let me find my sweet speed. It's right there. That's how fast I'm gonna go with that bait. Full time. That's my speed. I really don't change it up. I told you on the little guy, occasionally I'll give it a, just a little bump or a little bump bump. But on the big one, slow and steady wins the race. They just swim up and clobber that thing. Right there. Perfect speed. Very, very simple. And then last but not least, I tied on a Huddleston as a representation of the wedge tails. Any wedge tail, I have two speeds. Let's start out with that creepy, crawly winter time. Hopefully I don't lose this bait. There's a bunch of stumps out here in this cove. We'll see if I get it stuck. We've got a, you know what? I have retrievers with me but I also forgot to talk about this. If you are going to bottom crawl big swim baits or fish them around cover, you need a good retriever. This thing will save you literally thousands of dollars. I put them on my main one that I've got in this boat. It's a rusty mess. I've been using it for years. It's in the locker, but I tie a rope to it. You can also tie braid to them. And then you send, you put your line through the loops you send it down the line, it'll knock your baits free, but it will save you literally thousands of dollars in swim baits to have a good oversized retriever like this on the boat. I'll link that in the description as well. All right, time to crawl a Huddleston. We're gonna pretend it's January, water's 44 degrees, and we wanna get bit. When I tell people slow, no, go slower. Yeah, now cut that in half, go slower. Now cut that in half, now you got the right speed. Everyone thinks I'm joking. This is my winter speed, I kid you not. It takes forever to make a single handle turn. It's not exciting, it's pretty mind numbing until your rod goes dunk and you stick a double digit, crawl that thing. Okay, are you getting the picture? Look at this, fish blowing up over here. Insanely slow. If you go any faster than that, if the water's truly cold and you go faster than that, the fish let it go. If it's truly cold and you stay right in their strike zone, and the beauty of a, a Savage Gear or a Huddleston is those baits sit upright on the bottom and they just barely move. But that wedge tail, every time the bait bumps a rock, that wedge tail waggles. Because the bait is sitting upright, it looks right, it's not laying on its side. Every time it bumps and that tail waggles and you come over that rock, that's when that fish decides to clobber that thing. So I cannot stress enough how slow I'm talking about. Now, obviously we can't cover a bunch of water doing this, right? It'll take us hours to fish down a hundred yards of shoreline. So this is not something we're doing to cover a bunch of water. This is, we already know the big ones live on the point closest to the boat ramp where they stock the trout. Or we already know the bass live on the edge of the deepest bluff wall in the lake. Those obvious places, your lake only has two island tops in it. Obviously there's big ones on those island tops in the winter. Those are the places, high priority places, where we're gonna creep this thing, okay? You've got the idea now, and I am not exaggerating, it is that slow. I've had so many clients come on trips, I tell them slow, slower, 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 and I finally get them down to the right speed, and they're like, I've been doing it wrong for years. I had no idea how slow you meant, but it works. Now, when I wanna speed this thing up, what I'm looking for 
is I want to throw it out there, wind that bait until I see that perfect speed where this thing just looks like a trout coming through the water. Then I want to go a little faster until I find the speed where it looks nervous. That head will start to wobble a little bit and that tail's back there kicking like something is wrong. Like it's a trout that's scared or a kokanee or a shad that is scared. That little bit faster, that scared speed, that draws a feed response in the fish. Countless giants have eaten at that speed for me. When everybody else is creepy crawling, if I get a warm afternoon in the winter time and I think those fish might be up on the shoreline, I'm throwing this thing like a spinnerbait, chuck and wind, chuck and wind. Let me find that speed for you. It's right there. That's the speed. So everybody else is creepy crawling. And if it's a warmer winter day, I'm out there going this speed. Throwing that thing up in five feet of water and winding it out. Everybody thinks I've lost my mind. They have no idea we're catching big ones. Tim and I did this for years before anybody realized what we were doing. Nobody even thinks you're swim baiting up there going that speed. Just covering water. Pretend it's a spinner bait or a crank bait or a chatter bait. You're just covering water. And dong! When you're going this speed and they decide they're gonna eat that trout, they don't sort of eat it. They massacre that thing. They will crush that rod. It's insane how hard they hit it. Some of the best bites of your entire life will come when you're fast fishing a wedge tail bait at both ends of winter. We're talking October, November, and then we're talking February, March. That's when that shines. The rest of these baits, the retrieves are pretty similar. It falls into one of these categories or another. Uh, they're not complicated to fish, but there's some differences there between the baits. I think that shows you the range of retrieves. And I think the biggest takeaway is that some of this stuff Despite the size of the gear, how heavy the line is, the fact that it's an eight foot rod, the actual movements are very subtle. And I think that's overlooked. Guys, I hope this helps you. Swim bait fishing is amazing. You can catch the biggest fish of your life and you can catch a lot of them. And I wanted to go out of my way to show you the fine details for each one of these key baits. Uh, like I said, in the past, we've talked about a lot more baits. I left a lot of baits out of this video, but that's because I wanted to get down to hook sizes and retrieves for some of these core key baits that will help you catch a giant. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and we'll talk to you soon.